OK, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for day two of Data Driven 2021, uh, which is our fourth annual because we skipped one of the years uh, event uh, where we celebrate uh, Canadian data journalism as well as uh, data journalism and other interesting uh, investigative and open source journalism from around the world. Uh, we're going to have our the associate, sorry, the uh, dean of the Faculty of Meeting Creative Arts doing a uh, land acknowledgement in just a second, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, the 2021 Sigma Awards, which are the largest uh, data journalism awards uh, in the uh, in the world at the moment. And this year there's a cash prize and uh, it's open to everyone, including Canadians. So you can apply uh, by February 1st, 2021. So that deadline is coming up very shortly. So make sure to get your uh, submissions in uh yeah five thousand dollars plus us cash prize great supported by the google news initiative uh we've got some canadians on the jury panel but they are not biased unfortunately so uh, another shout out i would like to give is to and i don't we don't have slides for this one but the computation plus journalism uh symposium by northeastern university uh that is going to be taking place march 20th to 21st Oh, sorry, no, no, it's uh, sorry. That was last year. It's taking place Friday, February 19th. Uh, and I'll post links to that into the question and answer channel. And finally, uh, NICAR uh, 2021, which is being put on by the investigative reporters and editors, takes place March 3 to 5th uh, this year as well, uh, where which is what this uh, symposium uh, shamelessly rips off. So. Uh, please, uh, if you're interested in data journalism, investigative techniques and, and other cool things that you can do to find stories on the computer, please uh, check those all out and I'll post links to those in the question and answer channel. Uh, on that note, yeah, you'll see that if you are interested in sending, uh, giving a question to our presenters uh, on the side, there should be a question and answer pane where you can submit and then uh, we'll be, uh, we'll have time for question and answers during or after each uh, panel. So I think uh, I'll now turn it over to Guillermo Acosta, the Dean of the Faculty of, uh, the Faculty of Media and Creative Arts to do a land acknowledgement. Thank you so much, David. And uh, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Data Driven is, uh, is an event that is uh, always uh, an incredibly rich uh, learning experience and uh, and listening to the stories and listening to all the work that has been done behind the scenes to bring the truth to the journalism. It's it's uh, amazing and 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 really um, uh, brings light to to uh, dark times. So I'm, I'm happy that we're here to support this. But before uh, further ado, I'd like to um, do a land acknowledgement. And uh, starting with uh, quoting the, some of the, the words of uh, Jason C. Wright, our Dean of Indigenous Education and Engagement. Uh, we want to welcome you to the traditional lands that Humber College is located on. We do these to honor and respect the ancestors who lived on this land before us and currently still reside in this area. Humber invites you to join us in recognizing the living history of the land on which we are located and order our connection to it and recognizing that uh, this is an online event and you can be well across the world. I'm going to read the, the formal statement or the, of the basic land acknowledgement from where Humber is situated. Humber College is located within the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, known as Adobico, the place of the elders in Mississaugas language. The region is uniquely situated along Humber River watershed with which historically provided an integral connection for Anish Navi, Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples between the Ontario Lecture and the Lake Simcoe, Georgia Bay regions. Now home to people of numerous nations, Adobico continues to provide a vital source of interconnection for all. And it's always for me an honor to do the, to do this ritual, that the, the line of lodgement is something that I take with honor and, and uh, responsibility and with great respect. There are three aspects that are highlights for me by doing this. One is gratefulness, uh, interconnection and commitment to future generations. 
as a settler in this land, I'm, I'm grateful, but I'm also humbled for all the opportunities that this land has provided me. And I'm very respectful of the legacy of uh, indigenous peoples. I'm grateful for the learnings that they have passed on and, and, and conscious of all I had to learn, the relationship I have to, to build and the, the wounds that I, I, I'm committed to help heal. Interconnection for me is about our connection to the land, but also our connections with each other through meaningful relationship building. And lastly, is my commitment to build a better future for the generations to come, to leave the land in the, in the, in the best, in, in, a, in, in a better place, to leave our relations in a better place for generations to come. So it's it's something that for me is 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 a very important thing to do, and uh, an aspect that we need to take into account. Uh, when when we um, um, continue developing uh, our work in this in this land, so thank you, thank you for the opportunity to do this, and uh, looking forward to a great day of uh, learning and uh, and working. Thank you, thank you, David. Pass it back to you. Thanks, Guillermo. So we are now going to have. I'm, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the speaker kicking it off today. It's uh, Tom Cardoso of the Globe and Mail, a friend of the data-driven uh, symposium since the very beginning. Uh, and he, a little bit about Tom, he's a humble, humble sort of man. And he is a crime and data reporter at the Globe and Mail. And uh, he's, uh, he's previously done a lot of work on gun violence and white collar crime and uh, is a Michener Award nominated uh, journalist. So he's going to be speaking to us today about a years in the making investigation on racial bias in Canadian prisons. So uh, without further ado, uh, over to you, Tom. Cool. Uh, am I live? I think I'm live, right? Yeah. Thanks for having me, David. Uh, nice to, you know, meet everyone on the internet, I guess. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here, uh, please. Apologize the delay. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be chatting today about investigating systemic racial bias in federal prisons. Uh, it's a <laughs> bit of a hefty topic, but uh, it's something that I've uh, spent the last two years working on and off on, um, and arose from a a pretty uh, casual <laughs> freedom of information request. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to, instead of, you know, talking more so about techniques or whatnot, I figured I'd walk through the project and then talk a little bit about uh, the, how the analysis worked for that, what the reporting process looked like, and some of the takeaways and things that, you know, might be, if there are any lessons to be learned from this uh, story series, you know, what, what they actually are potentially. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. There's a link here, but I think uh, David's going to share a link uh, so that everyone can follow along if they so choose. Uh, this, uh, all these slides are also on GitHub, um, as you can see up here. So you're welcome to go and peruse the slides afterwards. I'm not taking anything down. Um, I try to keep my stuff up for as long as I can, and I've never taken anything down. So there you go. Uh, and of course, there's also a GitHub repository. The GitHub repo uh, includes links to a bunch of resources. Some of them are um, tools that we've built at the Globe. Uh, there's one called Starter that I'll be talking about a little bit later, but also things like my Freedom of Information Request uh, Google tracking sheet. Um, uh, there's also a tool to file uh, federal piggyback requests really, really quickly without having to fill out the form a million times, uh, as well as some other talks of mine, one on the basics of Freedom of Information Requests, one on more advanced data-specific information requests, uh, there's also a class on scraping that I taught a few years ago uh, that's up there. So you're more than welcome to go uh, and check it out afterwards, or you can always send me a message. So a little bit about me. Uh, like David said, I'm a crime and justice reporter at the Globe and Mail. Uh, I work a lot with data. Uh, I've been at the Globe now for uh, just almost seven years, I want to say. So it's been quite a ride. Um, and in that time, I've reported on all sorts of things, politics, you know, technology, uh, elections, COVID in the last year, but uh, my focus is really on the uh, criminal justice system. Um, and um, some, most of my bigger stories of the last few years or the stories that I focused the most on have been around the justice system in some form. 
so let's talk about bias behind bars. This was a series that, uh, as David mentioned, is two years in the making, more or less. Uh, we published the first story in the series in October. Uh, you can see here what the front page looked like and some of the pages in the, the package. There was another pa uh, page that I didn't include because I didn't want the images to be too small. <laughs> Um, but it's a, it was a long process to get from, you know, writing a couple, like a hundred words in a letter and putting in the mail to ending up with uh, this result here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we found, how we came to those findings, and perhaps what the process that I undertook means uh, and what you might be able to learn from it. Uh, so a quick crash course on federal prison. Um, anyone in Canada sentenced to two years or longer will go to federal prison. Uh, anyone with a sentence of two years less a day or less will go to uh, provincial jail instead. Most of the Canadian incarcerated population is in jail, not in prison, but the federal prison is a substantial part of the system. So it's a, a system you know, that's uh, fraught with complexity, as you can imagine. Um, and it's also a system with a massive, massive over-incarceration problem for Indigenous and Black people. As you can see here, uh, Indigenous uh, people are extremely overrepresented in the prison population. And when I'm talking about prison here, I'm talking about uh, only people in the federal system, no nothing about provincial. Uh, you can see the Black people are also overrepresented. Uh, this number has actually increased for Indigenous and Black people. Uh, it's closer to 30, it's just over 30% now for Indigenous people, and it's, uh, for Black people, it's approaching 10%. So there's a massive, massive over-incarceration problem, one that the government itself has acknowledged in recent years. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a topic that truthfully probably doesn't get covered enough. But this was one of the starting points for the reporting that we la eventually launched into. And it's an important thing to keep in the back of your head as you're looking through the rest of these slides. So our story, uh, our series, uh, Bias Behind Bars, is really focused on risk assessments. And risk assessments, you know, you've probably heard the term before potentially. Uh, they appear in a million different uh, functions and capacities. You know, whenever you walk through an airport, um, there are probably several layers of risk assessment being conducted at any given time. Um, you know, there's perhaps facial recognition technology hidden away somewhere in the airport that's scanning everyone's faces. When you go through customs, uh, there's uh, definitely computerized systems determining, okay, is Tom on any uh, watch lists? Is he, you know, uh, wanted? Are there any, uh, you know, outstanding warrants? All that kind of stuff. Uh, in prison, it's no different. Risk assessments are very, very important. What they are is simply standardized tests. I'll show you a couple of examples in a second, but they're uh, one, two, three, four page questionnaires uh, filled out by a parole officer that help the Correctional Service of Canada make decisions about inmates. Uh, so they're in essence designed to measure an inmate's risk to the public, as well as their odds of being rehabilitated. You know, how likely is this person to successfully reintegrate into society? They're Everyone gets them. Uh, some people won't get, uh, you know, the same types of risk assessments as others, either because of their race or because, you know, say you're going through a psychological assessment. You might not need to do all of the same tests that someone else does. Uh, but, you know, it, everyone from murderers all the way to simple fraudsters, everyone's getting these tests. And federally, they're used to classify, treat, and parole the 12 to 14,000 inmates in custody each year. And of course, as you can probably imagine, evaluating risk is tricky. There's a lot of room for uh, nuance and potentially bias. So here's just a couple of examples of what these risk assessments look like. Uh, you can see here that they're pretty, in some cases, they're very simple forms. In other cases, they're a lot more complex. Uh, all the information on the inmates who contributed these uh, assessments has been redacted for what it's worth. There are two scores in prison that matter most, in federal, in federal prison, I should say, that matter most. The, an inmate security classification and their reintegration potential score. A security classification matters a lot towards the beginning of an inmate sentence, and the reintegration potential score matters a lot towards its end. And 
you know, the security classification will be one of minimum, medium, or maximum. Uh, you've probably heard this terminology in the past. So uh, if you go to a maximum security, if you have a maximum security classification, it's very likely, almost certainly, you'll end up at a maximum security facility. Uh, if you're medium or minimum, you get matched institutions that match that level of security. And a reintegration potential score is basically an evaluation of how, you know, likely is Tom to uh, successfully reintegrate. Uh, and under the reintegration potential score, you'll end up with basically a low, medium, or high. So these are uh, complex tests that collapse people down into these two or these three dimensions, usually, sometimes four or five. Uh, there are a lot of issues in assessment. Um, for one, they're highly subjective to the assessor. So uh, there's something, there's a concept of uh, inter-rater reliability. There's a lot of research that shows that for a lot of types of assessments, uh, if I were to grade you, the results might be different than if someone else were to grade you. So these are obviously being conducted by a human being and includes all those biases that exist uh, for, for those reasons. The results are not always easy to interpret. Uh, Sometimes, you know, what is maximum security? What does that actually mean? Those are institutional definitions that have to be, um, that have to be kind of extracted and interpreted and taught and trained into people. It can take years to design an assessment and then years upon that to figure out if it actually works. Um, you know, there's a lot of research, a lot of uh, quantitative and qualitative research that has to happen for an assessment to be validated. That's the terminology. And uh, over time, these tools become less effective. Say, you know, I created a risk assessment for the Canadian population in 1950. Canada looks nothing like it did in 1950. So uh, it's quite likely that that risk assessment is not going to work as well anymore. And finally, there's the bigger topic of cultural bias. Cultural bias is a big umbrella term, but it basically means, you know, not everyone has the same lived experience. Not everyone grew up the same way. Not everyone had uh, has the same values. Uh, to say nothing of you know the things that they had no control over. Say you know did you grow up with a father and a mother in the household? Did you grow up poor? Or did you grow up rich? Did you grow up in a community where there was very high levels of very high rates of substance abuse uh, or alcoholism? Those are things that are really going to affect your life, and these are things that a lot of assessments really have a hard time accounting for, including within CSC. So what we did uh, was we collected data on 50,000 inmates uh, through a freedom of information request uh, spanning a seven year period, 750,000 rows of data broken down to the level of an inmate's individual charges. And we controlled for a ton of variables, age, gender, the severity of their offenses, past contact with the criminal justice system, what kind of sentence type they were on. Are they on a life sentence or a, which is called an indeterminate sentence or a determinate sentence, a non-life sentence that's gonna end at some point. And what we found was that black men are roughly 24% more likely after accounting for all of that stuff than white men to end up in maximum security at admission. Indigenous men are roughly 30% more likely to have the worst reintegration score at any point. And both are actually less likely to reoffend after controlling for those reintegration scores. So if you were to take uh, a thousand uh, inmates, let's say then, and you know, those thousand people going to prison are all white, uh, you can expect that a certain percentage of them, and then say like, you know, a hundred of them end up in maximum security. Uh, and these are people again with differences in their backgrounds, upbringings, et cetera, but they're all white. If you were to change their race to and turn and turn them into black people, uh, what you'd find is that 24 more people would end up in maximum security as a result of their race. And of course, as a result of all the things that come with race. But it's a really, those are really troubling numbers because they mean that these assessments are not capturing the the, the things that they're intending to capture. They're not capturing an inmate's risk. They're not capturing their uh, reintegration ability. They're, they're capturing racial and cultural factors that really have no business going into these assessments. Uh, and, of, and we also found in a separate story that 
these scores are even worse for Indigenous women. Uh, Indigenous women are actually 64% more likely than white women to end up in maximum security of admission, 40% more likely to receive the worst reintegration score. And in a story that we published in early January, uh, through a document, an internal document from Public Safety Canada that we obtained, uh, we found that the government had actually been warned that its assessments were possibly systemically biased, especially against Indigenous women in 2004, 17 years ago. So how did this come together? We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the process and how that we've gotten all the findings and whatever out of the way. Uh, well, for one, a lot of interviews, uh, a lot of calling people, more than 90 interviews uh, at this point. I'm still you know, reporting out stories even today. Uh, these sources have developed over a two year period. I would often, you know, at the end of every phone call with someone new say, can you give me the names of two or three people who you think I should be ta talking to? And, you know, two years out from that process, I've started to get to the point where I pick up someone, uh, pick up the phone to call someone and they say, oh, I've been expecting your call. <laughs> Uh, seven people have mentioned your name. That's when you know you're starting to build a pretty solid network of sources. Um, I also read hundreds of pages of inmate records. I have uh, some here right next to me. It's just it's a lot of paper. Um, also dozens of academic studies. I had to understand the history of risk assessment and the caveats that exist with risk assessments before I could really dive into it. And finally, one big, massive freedom of information request that, you know, while I say it's big, it fits on the CD, so it's perhaps not that big, but uh, 50,000 inmates, 750,000 rows of data. Uh, again, if you'd like to learn more about filing these data FOIs, you can check out uh, my other talk. There's a link here. I'm not going to click on it or it's going to throw me off. And so let's talk about the analysis process. Basically, started very simply, summarizing the data, making the uh, asking simple questions and you know at this point I'm doing things that you could probably be doing in Excel in Google Sheets whatnot but the more I looked at stuff the more I realized there's way too many things going on there's criminal history there's age which is a huge factor uh, gender obviously an enormous component and summary statistics descriptive statistics weren't going to get me to where I needed to go I wanted to be able to I found out pretty early that race seemed to be an important factor but I wanted to be able to isolate for it, to control for it. So this is where statistical modeling comes in. Specifically, I used a technique called a logistic regression, which is a very straightforward, by statistical standards anyway, uh, way of analyzing data and looking for patterns and the importance of different types of variables. Uh, I did this all in a statistical programming language called R. Uh, which I use on a daily basis, more or less. Uh, I highly recommend R if you've been thinking about picking up a statistical programming language. It's very easy to get going with it. Um, if you've written, if you've used another language before, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult actually because it's a bit of a, it's a bit idiosyncratic. Um, and if you do decide to use R, I highly recommend that you check out our data journalism template, Starter. Starter is a. Uh, basically a, a framework for doing data journalism on deadline uh, that we've developed and bulletproofed over the last couple of years. Uh, my colleague Michael Pereira started building that um, several years ago because it was exhausting to create folders every time and set up the time zones every time and whatnot. So highly recommend Starter if you're thinking about using it. I'm also happy to answer questions about it later on. Uh, Let's talk about the response to the story, very the stories, I should say, very briefly. We published the first story on a Saturday morning. By Monday afternoon, the House of Commons Public Safety Committee had announced a study of uh, systemic racism in CSC's risk assessments. The Prime Minister acknowledged the findings a few days after that. Uh, since then, I've heard many, many stories of lawyers using our reporting at parole hearings uh, as one of the many things that they argue when trying to explain why an inmate should be released. Uh, or given the chance to be paroled anyway. Uh, and just two weeks ago, a class action lawsuit uh, was filed against the federal government on behalf of tens of thousands of inmates, alleging that the custody rating scale, which determines the security classification, uh, is biased. And not only that, that CSC knew it was biased since 2004. So there's been a, a lot of response. Uh, I've received a lot of, you know, emails, a lot of, uh, uh, former and current inmates have come out of the woodwork to contact me. So it's been a, it's been pretty interesting to see 
the widespread impact of the story. It definitely goes beyond what I expected <laughs> when I was working on it in March or February or what have you and had no idea where uh, what I was finding was going to lead to. So takeaways. Uh, a few here. Uh, there are probably more uh, rattling around my brain, but I'll go through the big ones. First, uh, highly recommend filing very ambitious, big picture data FOIs, I call them. Asking for full databases, not summarized uh, information, not you know documents, not briefing notes, not memos. Ask for spreadsheets, ask for databases. You're well within your rights to request this stuff uh, under both federal and provincial legislation. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. It is a bit of work <laughs> and Usually you will ruin several public servants days, weeks, or months by filing some of these requests, but that's part of the course. Again, I have that other talk that goes into excruciating detail on filing these and the stumbling blocks that you'll encounter, the things that you should be doing as you're filing these, I highly recommend trying if you've never filed a data FOI before. Don't be afraid to pivot. Uh, I certainly did. I'd intended originally to look at the, <laughs> the racial breakdown in Canadian juries. <laughs> so I kind of ended somewhere completely different by the end. Pretty par for the course with these kinds of stories I find. All of the stories that I've worked on that I've been proudest of, uh, proudest of and that have been the most interesting to me are ones where I kind of took a hard left turn at some point down the way. Uh, experiment with new techniques whenever you can. I didn't know how to do any statistical modeling work whatsoever before I started working on these stories. Uh, I only made, I only had that realization in December that I probably needed to figure out how to do that stuff. And to do that, I built a uh, network of statisticians, criminologists, data scientists who could advise me and teach me all the things that I probably would have learned if I had gone to university and taken a non-film degree. <laughs> uh, but there you have it. Uh, try to disprove your own findings. Um, this is so important. At several points, I was convinced that I had made a very fundamental methodological error because the numbers that were coming back were so stark and surprising. I think that having the attitude that everything that you've come up with is wrong or disprovable or built on a flimsy foundation is extremely important because it'll really shore up your findings and bulletproof your analysis process. So try to attack your own story uh, as much as you can when you're working on large data stories like this. Uh, file a methodology story. This uh, is for a couple of reasons. One, it's trans it makes you, it allows you to be transparent about your process and the limitations and caveats in your analysis. Most people won't bother to read it, but some people will, and you'll get very interesting emails from those people saying, you know, why didn't you account for this? Uh, what about that? Uh, you know, can you send me the data? All of those are very interesting questions and they make you learn, think more about the process. Um, writing a methodology story is also a really great introspective process that allows you to really structure in your mind the steps that you took and why you took them. So I highly recommend doing that. We don't see that a lot in Canada. I mean, there's not a lot of, <laughs> probably most of the data journalists in Canada uh, are, have, are talking at this conference or have spoken at this conference in the past or have attended it in some form in the past, but I highly recommend writing a methodology story. And finally, you know, I find the way I approach data is just as one more tool in my toolbox. I have stories that I write that have no data in them whatsoever, I'm completely allergic to data. I wrote a story on UFOs in December. There's no data on that, I can guarantee you that. Um, never underestimate the importance of traditional reporting techniques, or I should just say reporting techniques. You know, you still need to be able to find documents. You still need to be able to build sources and you still have to be comfortable picking up the phone and having two hour long conversations with people about uh, obscure statistical analyses in psychological journals from the 1980s. You know, you have to be able to do that stuff. And that's really what will lead you to the stories that are really interesting and compelling. Um, I, there's a bunch of links to the st stories that we've run so far here. I just included this in case someone visits us later on and wants to actually read some of these, which, you know, I'd encourage you to try if, uh, or do so if, you, if you're interested in these stories. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much. I think we have some time for questions now. Yeah, so please, if anyone has, uh, I think it took like, oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah, it didn't take too long to get questions last time. So we got our first question up here. Uh, Zane, and I'm going to hazard a guess that this is our friend Zane Schwartz. 
As, as as you mentioned, Tom, everyone, uh, <laughs> every data, everyone who does data is probably watching this. Uh, no, but first off, the series was amazing. Thanks for doing it. Question: When trying to disprove your own findings, do you ever ask colleagues to come in and try to challenge your hypotheses? If so, how do you integrate that into your reporting process? Uh, that's a great question. That is a standard component of our. Uh, that's a standard component of our reporting process on larger stories. We have a what we call, for lack of a better term, a, a data verification step. So it's it's a basically a, an analysis fact check. And what that looks like is, you know, I'll have another data journalist who's never worked on the story within the globe read through my code books, rerun all my code, and see if one, you know, the steps that I took make sense and are explainable and defensible, and two, <laughs> they get the same results that I did. Uh, and every single time I've gone through this process, there have been errors or issues or methodological questions that uh, have led to stronger analyses. So it's absolutely important to do that. I do that even on smaller stories if uh, if it makes sense to do so. Um, you know, if if you have if you have a lot of steps to your analysis, it's really important. Uh, Robin Doolittle and Chen Wang's uh, Power Gap series, which started publishing last week. Perfect example of this. You know, I uh, Chen has written a lot of analysis, a lot of data cleaning code. And so uh, Michael Pereira uh, worked on that uh, back when he was still at the Globe. I have taken several passes at that data, uh, finding like, you know, oh, well, this, you know, clause here might mean that you have a few more dropped entries than you probably should and that kind of stuff. So it's very important, absolutely. We definitely need to have a data verification process. And I would say that, you know, part of the disproving your own hypothesis uh, step goes into that verification process. You tell the person, you know, tell me if you completely disagree with all of my decisions in this in this project. It's really important to do. And we have another question. Did you ever feel discouraged during the process of building such a big report? Any moments that you found especially challenging? Absolutely. Uh, until the day I published, I was convinced that the story was very, way too niche and no one would understand it, <laughs> and uh, that I could, I barely understood it. Uh, whenever I work on stories that are this scale, I always have this. Uh, I mean, this happens with any investigative piece, but I always have this uh, terror in the back of my mind that every source has lied to me. Uh, I've fundamentally misunderstood the data set that I'm looking at um, and that, you know, I've somehow committed a massive mistake and I'm about to be run out of the industry with pitchforks. So uh, absolutely, you know, at, at some points in January and February, I really wasn't sure where this was all going to lead. But there's a part of the uh, analysis process with large stories like this is that I find that the uh, I've compared it before to, you know, when you're building a house, in the beginning, the house is really creaky and, you know, things kind of fall into position a little bit. Windows might crack. But as the house settles, you know, you get less and less creakiness and you get less and less broken windows uh, and whatnot. And it's the same kind of thing with data analysis. I find that in the beginning, you know, your findings are changing by enormous margins day to day. They're swinging back and forth. You know, you're going from 20 percent of people did this to 40 percent of people did that. But as you tighten and tighten and tighten, that window becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually you're left with uh, a story where, you know, the change is uh, a few tenths of a percentage point. And that's when you know that you're pretty close to having something, report, uh, you know, shareable with readers. Cool. Well, I, I have uh, I have a question too. How much, if you, you, this, you've been working on this for about, you said, I think two years. So what, if you had to kind of break down each kind of period or how much time you spent doing each kind of part of this, like the reporting and, and the, the mm -hmm. analysis and things like, how would you break down, break up your investigation? Yeah, um, so filed an FOI on a whim in uh, August, I wanna say, or September 2018. Um, from there, it took until April to get the data. Uh, CSC was way over <laughs> their legislative deadline, uh, by the way, on that. Uh, once I got the data in April, I spent much of the summer trying to figure out what the data could tell me because at that point I wasn't yet interested in specifically risk assessments. It was such an enormous data set. There were so many things I could do with it. 
And by the way, we've actually open sourced the entire data set if anyone else is interested in looking at it. And, and what data set uh, is that? This is a, an extract of the Correctional Service of Canada's offender management system. Uh, it's their database for tracking all inmates. So uh, it's a seven year extract uh, that, that basically captures the lives of 50,000 people. So after the summer, um, in 2019, I guess, I uh, started to build an analysis in earnest, trying to figure out what I was going to do about the story. That took me about five months, six months, because again, I wasn't really going gung-ho on this yet. I didn't know what I was doing with it. It was more of a curiosity. By December, I'd figured out that uh, risk assessments was the thing that were most interesting to me. And so the next, uh, from basically January until October, a lot of my time was spent reporting the story out, uh, data-wise, and you know, talking to people, finding people to feature in the story, finding documents, whatnot, with a bit of an interlude in between for COVID stuff, where I just kind of throw everything away. Yeah, yeah, as as many people did. So, uh, well, yeah, well, I guess that kind of brings us uh, to the end. Uh, thanks a lot, Tom. Cool. Yeah. Have, for thanks for having me. Uh, again, the links are all available. So, if anyone has any questions, they're welcome to. DM me on Twitter <laughs> or whatever. Uh, I'm always happy to chat. I love talking about this stuff, and I've I have very uh, arcane and detailed thoughts about data journalism in Canada these days. So great. Well, thanks. Cool. So we're going to take a quick uh, break and come back at 10:45 uh, with Jada Bud and Henry. All right. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone, we're back and we are here with uh, Jada bowden Herney. Uh, she is a public affairs and policy analyst intern for the uh, File Hills Capel Tribal Council. Uh, she comes from the Member Two First Nations and is a, a Mi'kmaq and Cree First Nation who grew up on the prairies. After she finished a degree in poli sci and a diploma in Indigenous Communication of Arts at the First Nations University of Canada, Jada went on to work for the Institute for Investigative Journalism at Concordia University uh, as a research fellow and uh, the Saskatchewan reporter for Project Pandemic, which she will be sharing some details with us today about her work there. So uh, welcome, Jada. Oh, I think you're mute. Oh, hello. hello. Hi. I'm here. I'm on mute now. <laughs> yeah, so please uh, take it. Uh, take it away. Okay, hello everyone. That was a really nice introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my desktop um, so that we can get the presentation going. All right, um, so here we have my presentation and let's go. <laughs> All right, so again, my name is Jada Bowden Herney. I come from uh, Member Two First Nations, but I was born and raised in Regina. Um, I am an intern for the Tribal Chief's Office at File Hills Coppell Tribal Council, and I was a research fellow for Concordia University's Institute for Investigative Journalism, the IIJ. So if I say the IIJ at any point in this presentation, that's just me abbreviating it because the Institute for Investigative Journalism is very long. Um, so the IIJ is a news co-op with several universities and news organizations compiling data and pooling them together. We're partnered with the CAJ, um, which is the Canadian Association of Journalism, and also Esri Canada. So I'm my presentation has is a little bit shorter because I'm going to leave room at the end for questions. I know this information can be dry at times, so having interactive conversations about methodology and also the challenges of cold calling First Nations communities would be amazing. So if you have questions, um, I will. And I'll help answer them the best I can. So the IIJ was founded in June 2018. Um, uh, sorry, that was founded in June of 19. If you see on the screen right there, it says access to information should not be determined by where we live. That was partly why um, the IIJ was created, was basically to make it easier for rural and remote, remote communities to get readily and accessible information to use to empower the communities. So there across Canada, there is a growing silence um, and you can see this with the decline of media and their capacities, documented problems of intimidation, corruption and industry capture of government. 
this creates a very central problem that Canadian journalists and federal and provincial governments face, and that's the lack of data. And so if we have a lack of data, if the information is not there or it's hard to find for whatever reason, you can't fix a problem you can't measure. That's basically what it is. Um, so in our hopes to conquer that, uh, Patty Sontag, she's the director of the IIJ. She created a network of universities that would gather the missing data as part of an educational experience that teaches investigative and data skills. So here we have two uh, projects that the IIJ worked on or that created. Uh, one is the price of oil and the other is tainted water. Um, these are really long investigations. They've gone over for five years um, and they put a lot of manpower into them. I met Patty through the Tainted Water Project through a class, um, through a class basically, and I worked my way into the Institute as a research fellow um, on a project that's still in production too. Um, so through the projects, we're overcoming powerlessness and by making anecdotal specific and actual. So if it's measured, we must, must, must fix it. Um, so here we see there's an oil field and just by looking at that, we can see that there's a problem. There's rust and erosion on the barrels and that's really not a good sign at all. So how do we know there's a problem? We obviously see that there is, um, the barrels shouldn't look like that. And there, where we can get a hypothesis on that is there could be a possible contamination. How do we know that? Well, we don't because we need better access to data. We need more leads and more collaboration. And really collaboration is one of the tools that the IIJ uses. Um, this is the big network of students that we have. We have from the West Coast to all the way to the East Coast. And we have a lot of representation um, all over the place, especially in the prairies. Um, with such a big network of people, uh, we have so many different backgrounds and perspectives and also languages. Uh, we have obviously French and, uh, and English, but we also have indigenous language speakers uh, that comes from the different universities like the University of uh, First Nations University of Canada. And that's, that's where I'm from. I come from the, I graduated from there. Um, so if you see this, all these beautiful faces, these are the contributors to Project Pandemic. So each of these people come from all over Canada and they come from, again, different backgrounds, perspectives and histories. Now, histories that we bring to the newsrooms gives us strength. It's really, really crazy to think in my mind that 16 out of 18 of us would have been excluded from investigations in the past. So when we think about that, um, our, our diversity is strength. So allowing us to report regional stories nationally across all groups and communities, it's just, it's just amazing. So we must represent our communities in the end. So here we have um, kind of where we put all of our uh, information and data on. So once we confirmed a case, we would input our information into this database. Uh, the picture on the right is where I would put all my information once I entered the data and I would double check to see if it's on the map and that's the one on the left. Uh, this would allow us to get really good visual aspects of the data and would also help us narrow in on possible investigations. So they're really cool I, um, and they're very interactive. Um, the, the one map on the left, those are the maps that we uh, gave out um, during uh, the, and we're still giving out these maps to our uh, partners. You, they're very interactive. You can just go zoom up to them, click them. Um, there's one right there where it says there's three infections. So it gives great detail and also they're really interactive and fun. That's the best part of it, I think. Um, so Project Pandemic, we have reported over 30,000 uh, outbreaks on our maps and there's probably way more now. Uh, from when I last did this, or not pre last presentation, uh, when I last updated it, uh, with nearly a hundred articles and broadcasts. And when I think about that, that really, really excites me because these stories are filling a gap in reporting and allowing community-based stories to be told. So this kind of brings us to the main reason why we're here, a community story that is brought forward. Um, 
So here we have three stories that uh, the report from the report we produced on uh, methodology or not the methodology uh, on distance from care. Um, and we produced these for our partners and we got three wonderful stories and they're so unique in their own ways uh, because if you look at the global article, they really go into Roberta Bell did that one. Uh, she really went into talking about the systemic issues and the barriers indige indigenous and remote community space. She um, had uh, she followed a family that had to travel over 500 kilometers uh, and got airlifted to just get um, the medium level of care for COVID. Uh, so that is something that it was really big um, in that story. And then she added the other aspects of uh, the challenges First Nations people are facing. Um, so the Albert Prince Albert Daily Herald. Uh, Peter is a data journalist himself, and so he really laid out our information really well and precise. Exactly how, if you're really into data, um, that's a, the one you kind of want to go to because it just gives you all that information that you want. And then the Star Phoenix that was teamed up, uh, and they did the news story. They broke it down really simple and easy to read and it's not as intimidating as reading so much data. But if you love data, it, all stories are amazing, I think. <laughs> so going into it, um, here you see my wonderful colleagues, um, Angie and Karina. Uh, we, they, like, they contributed a lot to this project and it couldn't have been done without them. Uh, so I, if they're here, hello. Um, before we can get into this beautiful map of the Indigenous Communities Risk Map, and we will get into it um, after the presentation, we'll play around with it um, to show you like the cool interactive side of it. Uh, we needed to see if there was a problem. We knew going into this research that there was a lot of rural hospitals that were getting uh, closed. Uh, so their emergency services were closing and they were being turned into COVID wards. This would increase the distance someone would need to go for emergency care, something that is already an issue without COVID. So we worked from there and built on that. Uh, so during the first outbreak, remote communities were being impact, impacted the most uh, by narrowing, narrowing in on Saskatchewan and First Nations communities. It really allowed us to get a bigger uh, to show a bigger problem that is being largely ignored, and that is distance from care and quality from care, lack of PPE and safety equipment, large population of elders, overcrowded housing and poor uh, housing infrastructure. So all of these concerns uh, to the nations uh, were huge uh, when we talked to them. The major risk factors we found are represented in this map and the IIJ created. So when you, when we really got into uh, these First Nations and we talked to them, the biggest things that we really saw was their their fear for, or not their fear, um, they were really concerned about their elders. So with the large population of elders, uh, First Nations people really hold elders as knowledge keepers of language, culture, um, and tradition. So to them, uh, losing an elder is losing such rich history and they express these concerns to us really um, empathetically and they were they were concerned and I know that a lot of populations uh, throughout Canada is really concerned about the LTC areas and the uh, older populations so it just shows that we're all the same and we're all human. <laughs> Uh, so initially we found our leads through establishing relationships with any First Nations that would pick up our, uh, so any First Nation that would pick up and answer our calls. So we basically made a list of all the First Nations in uh, Saskatchewan and we just started calling them up and asking for their pandemic leads. Um, we got out of 70, we only got 15 First Nations that would talk to us and this, and through basic conversation and some questions queued up, we could confirm our hypothesis that distance from care, quality of care, and lack of PP and safety equipment were concerns for them. So as you can see, this is our database that we used um, uh, when we were calling the nations. We try to make it really straightforward with yes and no questions because 
and nobody like because we need to save their time, but we also allowed room for additional comments. This really showed us this really, really showed us and allowed us to see the nation's concerns and how they were similar to uh, most of the time, but also allowed us to see the changes with each call that we made. Uh, we made multiple rounds of calls to stay updated with the situation in these nations as the pandemic progressed. In some cases, we found that while concerns about COVID fluctuated, depending on the resources they had, distance from care and uh, was was an issue that did not change. It was constantly uh, one of the issues that they would reaffirm to us. So distance from care and the quality of care. So through this process, we made anecdotal evidence concrete. Um, so taking in all the known risk factors, infrastructure, housing density, and um, agent population into account, the IIJ created a map that included all 70 First Nations and all the COVID care hospitals with a 50 kilometer radius that showed how far care was from their locations. Um, a report like this uh, was done by local people who were concerned about an area that would have been ignored. This is really a great example how Indigenous and non-Indigenous -indig journalists working together and producing something to better a community. And yeah, um, so I leave you with the last quote from Roberta Bell's piece. Um, while it's not the most uplifting or inspiring quote, it does show um, the large issues that these nations are facing and how hard COVID has exacerbated many systematic issues. So the quote says, data from Statistics Canada compiled as part of Project Pandemic suggests that it is overcrowding happening in house households of 90% of First Nations in Saskatchewan. A major challenge of people living under these conditions who need to quarantine due to COVID-19. So having these new perspectives and stories being told really allows the broader public to educate themselves on these issues and it really empowers individuals to demand for better and hopefully have the support of their non-Indigenous communities to help them uh, along the way on this journey. So that's my presentation on how we kind of found uh, this issue. Um, we can open it up to questions if you want, if there's any there. Yeah, we'll give it yeah, a sec. We'll give it a sec. Oh, for some questions to come in. You may want to you want Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I think we're just getting a little bit of uh, feedback there. Yeah, so uh, I had a quick question. Uh, while we wait for some to come in, which is how did I mean uh, the fact that you're reporting on COVID-19 and it is COVID-19 uh, affect your on the ground reporting and, and things like that while doing this? Or what would you have done differently perhaps if I mean, you were able to, if those restrictions or, or concerns weren't in place, which I know seems kind of counterintuitive because you're reporting on COVID-19, right? So if that was the case, you wouldn't be doing this story, but just as a hypothetical, how would, if you're collecting data, how would you have gone about it? Well, the thing is um, when I was like talking to the communities, um, a lot of First Nations people really like to see and be with them and talk with them and um, I think that was the big thing that hampered our investigation is the fact that I couldn't get into the communities and talk to them. Um, we probably would have had more people that responded better to us because we did have some people who were kind of like, we're busy, like, why are you even calling us? Um, but then the nations that I did have some connection to um, in some way, uh, I got into there and just by cold calling and just constantly going, um, I, I think the biggest thing that would have changed is me actually going on the ground and going into the communities, obviously, to collect the data. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's the one thing that would have changed. Great. Well, we're still waiting, I think, for a few questions coming. Why don't you take us through a bit uh, the map? Uh, okay. created, yeah. So this is the map that we created. It's really um, cool and interactive. Um, as you can see, um, let me zoom up to it. Uh, we have, this is it, this is just Saskatchewan. So on this side, this shows um, the senior, uh, like how the aging population and what they are. The bigger they are, usually means that 
it, it has a large overpopulation or the population is really big for elders. Um, as you can see, north is kind of has the uh, more uh, areas that would be concerned. The overcrowding you can see is also a concern throughout all nations. Um, seriously in the um, north end, I know that right over here, I know people um, and some people live in houses uh, like a three bedroom house with five to like seven people. And that's just kind of natural. Like it's it's just how it is on some reserves. Um, and so this is like an issue that obviously um, is compi compiled with COVID-19 is a recipe for disaster, right? Yeah, and um, we actually have a question in right now. Uh, Emma W is asking, uh, how is the experience of cold calling communities and asking them these questions? Uh, were they responsive and how did you build trust kind of remotely? That's, that's a really good question. So um, the biggest thing that, so cold calling people, like uh, the first thing that I really did initially was go on um, radio, up, like I call, went up, called a former friend who is a radio host up north and I told him about our project and um, he was like, perfect, let's broadcast it. And so the first thing we initially did was do a, like a call out saying like, hey, we're here, we're gonna be calling nations um, and just be prepared. And if you wanna report, come self report. But cold calling them was definitely a real challenge. Um, the With First Nations people, they really need to see, um, the first thing that they will ask you is like, where are you from? Who, like, who are you? They wanna know your kinship. They wanna know where, like your connection. Um, and so uh, going up north, there was, I had to literally find people who I knew or that my mom knew or that my dad knew and just know a person to know a person to tell that person that I'm calling. So. It was very interesting on how we did it, um, but it was the biggest thing that I could take away from it is that uh, the, the respect of kinship that uh, and connection and connectivity that you need to get into these uh, communities and um, cold calling them was just a really big experience of learning, um, learning histories and cultures on top of um, trying to find an issue issue to talk about and report on. Um, so yeah, um, and it I guess the biggest takeaway I think um, from cold calling uh, First Nations people is the fact that we must see the importance of Indigenous institutions such as the First Nations University of Canada, um, the Inca program, uh, part of uh, First Nations University. Uh, without those connections of First Nations on the ground, it probably would have been way more difficult. I know that my um, my colleagues, uh, Katrina and Angie, were having more difficulty than I was having because I just had that connection. And so the importance of uh, community-based reporting is really big when it comes to First Nations. And so we really need to see the importance of these institutions such as APTN, NBC, and community radios, and um, the journalists that are coming out of them to produce better work. So, yeah. <laughs> I think we have another question. Um, what map development is that, or, or how is it developed, or, or what third party program are you using for the data analytics? Um, good question. So after um, all of us, we compiled our data and we analyzed it ourselves. Uh, the IJ uh, had a data journalist or not a data map uh, scientist uh, come in and create this for us. So we did all the heavy lifting of the reporting and getting the data and now and analyzing it and then we gave uh, it to her and she just compiled it all together and created this map for us. Um, the list of hospitals that we got uh, was a donation. So the locations and capacities that hospitals had, we had a donation from uh, Enveronics. And um, when they gave us that, we confirmed, uh, we 
uh, verified it with Stats Canada or Stats, uh, no, Health, Health, uh, Sask Health, and then uh, then we gave it to our uh, really smart data scientist. <laughs> I think I would also add, I think just maybe to get more, a little more technical because I know a little bit about the project is that this was made using uh, your your partner Esri. Uh, yeah. There's there's their ArcGIS uh, software. So yeah. I'll put that in the chat for anyone who wants to just Google that ArcGIS. Put that there. Uh, and finally, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, where did this idea for the story come from? That's a really good question. So Patty was the one um, who came to us with the idea. Um, she has a story, basically what happened was that her aunt uh, was too far, like she passed away because she was too far from care. And I think I can even zoom up to where it is, um, Meadow Lake. So like her farm, her family's farm is out here. And by the time they got to Meadow Lake, she already passed away. And so she had actual experience of uh, the the really big issue of distance from care and how it impacts uh, everybody. And so she came with that idea and she just put that hypothesis down with us and we just went with it. Um, we knew that hospitals were closing their emergency services, which would make it even worse, um, the problem even worse in the long run. Um, but this was during the first initial wave uh, of COVID and um, they no longer have these hospitals shut down for COVID wards, but who knows? Uh, Saskatchewan's cases are really high. They're fluctuating, so who knows? <laughs> I have uh, one more question for you, which is now you've, uh, you're, you're, you've moved on, at least for the moment, so you're doing a, a role that is maybe uh, more uh, outreach or, or activism or community uh, base as opposed to uh, straight journalism. So I guess how did, I'm always interested in how the skills that you learned on this project and the work has kind of informed the work that you do now. Um, it really, it's, it's different. Like you have different mindsets. Like um, the mindset I went going in here was like, what is the problem? How can we fix it? Um, and don't get me wrong, I have that uh, same uh, mindset going into with my other job, but this one is it's you need to find the actual evidence and back it up as for when I'm working my day to day job, I'm really looking for the research that is supporting that can better our community. Um, so I guess the research that I guess the skills of um, really getting into communities and talking to them and seeing what their problem is uh, really helped me. Um, the empathizing and conversations. Uh, the one thing that a lot of people need to know is that when you're calling First Nations, you're not on the phone for for like five to ten minutes. You're on the phone for probably an hour to like two hours because if they're going to give you information, you need to give them information too of some sort. So it's really learning to work with the communities and knowing that it's um, cross sharing um, and collaborating with them in order to get good uh, data. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing that like really helped me move on with this job. Um, and it's really interesting to see that uh, when I get stats um, when I do reports for uh, the Tribal Council. I can look at the stats and I know how to look at them. As for before, I probably would have never known and I probably would have been having a lot of difficulty. So yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Jada, for your time uh, today. And uh, yeah. yeah. And I uh, hope you can stick around and maybe watch a bit more before you get back to work. And uh, but yeah, we're going to take a, a quick 15 minute break and come back at 1130 with uh, Mahima Singh from the Canadian Press. So, Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the second day of Data Driven 2021. Today with me, I have Mahima Singh, a data developer at the uh, did, is it the Digital Data Desk? Did I get that right, uh, Mahima, at the Canadian Press? 
Yeah. All right, great. And uh, before joining uh, the Canadian press, Mahima is actually an award-winning uh, international data visual uh, journalist. Uh, she's reported on uh, former President Trump, school shootings, hurricanes, and the drug epidemic in Florida. In 2019, she covered the media in South and East Asia for the BBC. And that's what uh, she's going to be speaking with us about today. So welcome, Mahima. Hello. Hi, David. Can you Hi. see me? Oh. Yeah. OK, great. Hi, everyone. Hi, David. Thanks for the introduction. Really excited to be here. And thank you, everyone, for coming to this panel on a Friday in a pre-lunch hour. Really appreciate all your time. I hope everyone's enjoying Data Driven. It's been really exciting two days. Um, I'm Mahima. I'm a data visual journalist. I currently work with the Data Digital Desk at CP as a programmer slash journalist slash developer. Some of you may have uh, attended Lucas's session yesterday where he spoke uh, a bit about the work that we're doing at D3 and about automation and how we're helping free up journalists' time. Lucas is really the best, and if you haven't already followed him on social media, um, now would be like a good opportunity to go and do it. And also while you're at it, you could also follow D3. There we go, little subtle, not so subtle D3 plug. But today we're going to be talking about a project that I did for BBC in 2019. And um, I'll be taking you through how the idea of the project came up about, what was the infrastructure we set up for the data collection, the problems we faced, the kind of fun we had on the way, and also the things we learned on the way. Um, I'm just going to share my desktop here so we can start with some of the things. Um, There we go. Can everybody see that? All right. Oh, I hope you can. I hope everybody can see this. Um, well, we're going to look at how um, generally we have this idea that we use data to create news, right? Like we're we're using we're making news from data. But I'm uh, going to talk about how we can actually collect data from news and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, I have a lot to go through and I hope that by the end of the session you um, you know leave um, you leave with some story ideas of your own and you take back some of the learnings that I had, especially in terms of working on a bilingual multilingual project that across different regions. And um, also I hope that you know you you think of news as a form of data collection as well or like as a source to be able to collect data from. OK, so let's just get into it. Mahima, I just wanted to say you might want to move your little preview window there out of the bottom right corner. Oop there we go. Sorry about that. All right, um, so there we go. In um, 2019, I was working for BBC in their New Delhi Bureau in India and we were covering South and East Asia. But the project that I'm going to talk about is something I did while working for another team within the BBC, and it's called monitoring. It's a um, team that reports and monitors on um, the mass media around the world. It's kind of like a media analysis team, BBC's media analysis team. And whoa, where'd it go? Sorry about that. Just use the keyboard. Um, right, so the kind of coverage that this team does is very different from BBC News. It's more in-depth analysis about a country and its media. As you can see from the headlines here, it is subscription based. Um, so, it's, uh, so a lot of the work is behind a hefty paywall, but um, you can follow them on social media and they do put out like really interesting threads about the regions that they cover. And you can look them up that way. Um, so I was brought onto this team to provide this kind of media analysis and research with the the data perspective and a visual perspective. And then in 2019, as part of BBC Monitoring's coverage for the Afghanistan elections, I did a data project where um, we collected data from news articles about the number of people who were killed um, in Afghanistan. And um, 
it was a really thrilling project in the sense that I was able to cover another country sitting in New Delhi in India. And that was really interesting. Here we go, the idea how it came up. The goal of the project was to see if there had been an increase in election related attacks by the Taliban. This was the first election after US Taliban negotiations had happened earlier that year. And there was speculation that there was going to be less violence in general because of these agreements that came out of these negotiations. So we wanted to see if the data that we collected matched our hypothesis. And the project was initially built uh, on another project that BBC did. It's something BBC News did along with monitoring in 2018. It happened in parallel. In this project, they wanted to track the number of people killed and injured in Afghanistan for a span of one month. They were trying to look at the war in Afghanistan through a quantitative lens. It was a really, really big project. There were around 50 people involved in it. They looked through, discovered all of Afghanistan's national, provincial, local media. And, uh, you know, they were able to record a lot of um, cool insights. Um, some of the um, results that came out was that on an average, um, in the month of August, 74 people were dying um, a day. We were able to record 600 instances of violence and around 2000 people died. So it was averaging around, you know, around 74. But what was really interesting from this study was that um, of all the people who died, more than, you know, half of them were Taliban fighters themselves, which came as a big surprise. One of the reasons could be, could have been, and this is only speculation, like there's, you know, there's no proof of it, that the US um, did increase a bunch of US led airstrikes and night raids that were targeted towards the Taliban. So that could be one of the reasons why we're seeing so many um, Taliban fighters in the casualties here. But the brunt of the violence was faced by the Taliban and the um, government forces, like Afghan government forces. So this was a project that was already been doing, was already in the works on the site. It hadn't been published yet. But we wanted to sort of take this project and, you know, take it one step further and ask the question that did the elections lead to an increase in attacks by the Taliban? And that was how this project came about to be. It was more of like a part two of an existing ongoing project, kind of like an offshoot of something running on the side. And even though it was it stemmed out of something that already existed, it was still it was still very, very different. The project that we did in August, the really big one, it had a whole team of journalists um, on the ground to verify data, collect data and stuff like that. But this project that I'm going to talk about, it only had two people on it. It was just me and um, it was just me and Valid Kayumi. He's a reporter from BBC in Afghanistan, uh, BBC monitoring in Afghanistan. And he was brought onto the project as someone who had ground knowledge about the media in Afghanistan, you know, he, he's from the country, he knows the language. And then I was brought onto the project as someone who has data skills. And um, yeah, it was just the two of us. So with Valid in Kabul and me in Delhi, the two of us and our, um, and our editors from our respective bureaus, we kind of like banded together and like the four of us, we were just like, all right, let's let's start this project. You know, let's let's get get answers to some of those questions that we had asked earlier. And um, as you know, some of you might have guessed by now that we use Google Google Sheets to collect the data because it was just two of us. It was me and Valid, and he was uh, going to input the data, and I was just going to double check, or cross check, and then do the analysis later. But we also really heavily relied on Google Translate, um, and by we, I mean me, because I didn't, and I, I mean I don't know Pashto, which is the language that's spoken in Afghanistan. So I would use Google Translate to, um, on Chrome, there's a translate feature. You can translate the page into, into English from any language. So to verify the sources, I would translate the page, read the article, and read the article in Google Translated English, and then um, you know verify the data that way. But we'll come back to Google Translate in just a bit. Um, the data was collected from 28th July to 28th September. 28th July is when the, um, campaign started when campaigning started and 20th September is the day of polling. So we thought that would be a good time frame to be able to say if these um, attacks were related to the 
election. So Wali went through all the media and social media sources, tracking every violent incident uh, related to the elections. Um, and then he would read through the article and then break it down into like these more granular um, points and put them into the database. So stuff like nature of the violence, was it a shooting, a bombing, was it an air raid, was it shelling? Who was the targeted victim? Was it, um, say, a campaign manager? Or was it someone who worked for the election commission? Or was it a voter, a citizen? Um, things like that, the number of casualties and deaths, where it happened. And then the source of information is what's really like the crux of the uh, project here. Um, our methodology was to uh, double source everything. Like we had set that in, in, in stone saying that um, we're going to get a media source that says this, this event happened, so many people died, but we're only going to put it in our database if we can operate that with another source. And this, um, and that was how we like decided to, you know, um, make other, verify the data to make sure that our database is sound. Um, this is a little bit about how I did the did my my part of the work. Well, he would put in the sources, and then I would go in and read them, check them, and make sure that uh, we had filled in the database correctly to say that you know three people from security forces were killed, and here we have three um, Taliban fighters, Daesh fighters. Um, but sometimes it was really easy because if it was in English and Tolo News is an organization that reports in English from Afghanistan, it'd be great. I'll be able to read it. I can figure it out. But then we also had to double source. And then what I would do is Google Translate a Pashto article that was sent to me by Valid and then try to match what I'd seen in the tweet. And when it worked, it worked. It was great. It was, you know, it was awesome. But sometimes and then we'll talk about this a little bit later also. It was really frustrating because Google Translate translates the words for the words. It's very hard to, for it to give you like contextual translation. So towards the end of it, we were just like, I was pulling my hair um, out of my head trying to figure it out because I didn't know Ashton, but we had to verify everything, you know, two sets of eyes. And um, yeah, and that's where like frustrations come in. And we're going to talk about a little bit of uh, what went wrong and how we fixed it. This is a picture of me during the project, uh, just being so frustrated by fact checking, but also trying to remind myself that, you know, it's important that we did it. It was part of the project. I just had to go through it. This is one of those um, 16 hour, 17 hour days where you get the, you know, it's like 11 p.m. and you're just done with life. Um, but yeah, these are these are a few points that we'll go, we'll go through one by one. Um, we were the only people who were doing it. It was just two of us. It was Walid and me, and we would Skype each other sometimes to verify things. And there was also a sort of translation um, gap between the two of us, um, and that didn't really help speed up the process. Even though it was, you know, interesting to be able to like participate with people who don't speak the language that you do, it was still um, something that slowed us down. Lost in translation. This is coming back to the Google Translate point because I didn't know the language. It was very hard for me to convince myself that the data in the database is correct if I wasn't able to like do it myself, you know, like fact check it myself. Um, so Walid would like fill it in, read all the articles, and then I would go in and try to figure out, you know, if just to double check, just to be the second pair of eyes. But then Google Translate would always sort of like mix up the numbers for some reason. Like if it was 13 people dead, Google Translate would somehow figure, think that that's an address and put that in as 13 some address. So I was just frustrated with the translations, trying to figure it out, and I didn't know the language. So um, one of my colleagues from the BBC Bureau in, in India, in New Delhi, they cover Pakistan. They um, put, um, so, they, so they know Urdu and it's, uh, sort of similar, so they must have heard me grunting at my screen, pulling out my hair, and then they came and slid this little note on my desk that had um, English translations and for the Urdu numbers, which are the same as Pashto, and it was such a nice, sweet little gesture from a from a colleague and a nice moment of human connection that you know I wanted to share it with you. But this also sort of gave me the idea to you know not only look at um, the English translated versions of the articles, but also because now I. I could think about like, hey, this is a 10. So there is a 10 in this article. And then when I read it in Google Translate, a little, it helps me figure out a little bit more and then take it from there. Fact checking. Because we were double sourcing everything, we wanted to make sure we did it right. 
And it's very easy to double source on two media sources. Um, but we didn't want to do that because media tends to amplify each other, you know, like take someone else's report and just add something or just maybe just directly copy paste the same thing. So we didn't want to do that. We were trying to make sure we had a media source, but then we also had an official, uh, you know, like a government source, maybe the army or the police or sometimes even the Taliban themselves. And um, this is going to this is going to match in with the next point because that was really confusing because because um, how do you trust the Taliban with numbers? How do you trust the government with numbers also? That leads to source credibility. The Taliban and the Afghan forces as well, they tend to kind of um, exaggerate the other side and pull up their numbers, but then also downplay their own losses. So it was very hard to decide which source to use when it came to putting in the numbers. And this point here, this is sort of a little segue into our methodology. When we weren't able to double source, we decided to follow AIP numbers. And AIP is the Afghan Islamic Press. It's um, it's an independent news organization that came out of uh, that that's that's out of Afghanistan. But um, you know, we were able to. So we decided to say that if we weren't able to double source stuff, we're going to use AIP as our only source. But the data journalists and me are the are, you know the data. The data person in me was really um, like it really irked me that we were double sourcing some data, but we weren't double sourcing the rest. And I was it, I was really like a type about it. Sometimes that would cause Valid a lot of problems. Um, but yeah, that was so this is some of the like frustrations we had. And most of it's just like coming from me being very uh, being a stickler for methodology. But I think I learned to let go of that and, you know, be OK with the methodology changing as we went through something as we went through the process. One interesting thing that I found when I want to share with everyone here is while I was looking for sources um, to double, you know, to double source, we were looking at Taliban. I was also looking at the Islamic State and um, I learned that the Islamic State every month puts out a newsletter with infographics about the kind of violence that they've, you know, they've committed that whole month to do like a roundup. And um, I just thought this was so interesting, especially as a, you know, coming as a data whiz person, looking at these graphics and being like, OK, what was what were they thinking when they were making these graphics? And also, it's so fascinating to think that there was a designer sitting from the Islamic State making these um, infographics. And there was probably an editor, too, who wrote the copy and put it in here, you know, just like how we as journalists have little teams, they have two. So it was pretty um, exciting to look at like data journalism done by extremist groups. So that was a that was a little sidetrack there. And we'll talk about the results that uh, we found from our from our investigation of the data. We were only looking at election related violence. So um, you can see here that this like on the on 28th, which is the day of polling, it had the most casualties. And that makes sense because that's when people were out on the streets. They were waiting in line to you know cast their votes. These two were events. They were campaign rallies that happened on these days um, and those were attacked. That's why the numbers are so high. But then the rest of the time it, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't like a staggering kind of um, data point that we that we found out. We did kind of match the previous project's um, estimation on Taliban fighters, though, just like in the previous project, we also found that half of the fatalities, most of the fatalities were Taliban fighters themselves. And then we were also able to sort of like say, figure out that during that time, Ashraf Ghani's campaign was the one that faced most of the violence. Um, I think 74 people were killed and 160 people were injured. Uh, in rallies for Ashraf Ghani and his um, running mates. Not to say that other candidates didn't have attacks. Um, Abdullah and him, Akhtiar, they were two of the other candidates. They also had attacks in the rallies, but it wasn't as, um, you know, it wasn't as massive as Ashraf Ghani. Uh, he was the, you know, he was running for election and then later he would go on to win the election. That was uh, also like a cool thing that we were able to find out. And finally, when we tallied all the data, our average data or average deaths per day didn't like it sort of matched what we found in August as well. So to answer our initial questions, violence didn't seem to increase that much during the election campaign. 
Um, but even though it wasn't what we were hoping the answer, I don't want to say hoping, but it wasn't what we had in mind for the project because um, we just assumed that the violence would be more during elections and that was not the outcome. Uh, it was still an important project to do. Sometimes newsrooms tend to just abandon stories that don't meet the um, initial pitch or like when we're investigating and then the data exploration comes up with say a dull answer or something that's not for catchy headlines. They just tend to like drop the project or leave the project. But in this case, we were able to like take what we got, all that hard work we put in. And then, you know, even though the answer wasn't a spicy headline or something like that, it was still an important story because, you know, they were attacks during the election. Voters lost their lives and they were trying to participate in democracy. And that was how we were able to like spin it, change the story, change it from our original idea, and then still do the story. And here we'll sort of talk about a little bit of things I learned during this project. The first thing is um, archive all your sources. The um, panel from Bellingcat yesterday talked about archiving your sources, archiving your data, and it sort of like merges in here as well because I learned that when we were looking at Taliban sources, sometimes the links will be dead when you try to go back to them. So it's always best to, to take screenshots of social media tweet like Facebook, Twitter, if you're using Instagram as a source, make sure um, you can you know find cached versions of it online, go to the Wayback Machine, get like uh, links of it that existed before. And I personally do this with all my, my projects as well. Every time I get a byline, I just take, um, I just print a PDF of the web page just to make sure like it's always there and then you store it somewhere just so that you have it and then you can go back to it if if you ever need to. Don't be married to your initial idea. This is something we spoke about before and um, it's OK to change the story as the investigation progresses. Sometimes the data can be the story itself. Maybe you're collecting something that no one has you know, done before. Methodology needs to be dynamic and change. This is more of a personal learning for me. I was so uh, so strict about the methodology that I didn't leave any room for error and caused more problem and frustration for me trying to like match it. I was so A type with the double sourcing that even though double sourcing is a great process to have, it's better to loosen the reins sometimes. I mean, you you don't want your data to be dirty, but it's OK to have a fuzzy data set sometimes. And this is something that I had to come to terms with as a very like, you know, strict. Um, data person. Don't be afraid to do international stories. Um, you know, I was thrilled I could do a story sitting in India about another country because data is just available. And if there's open data available, you know, there's so many possibilities you can do. Um, if there is data, if it's open and it's available and it's within your your or on your company's mandate to do international stories, who's to say you can't do a story about charities in Ukraine if the data is available? And if these data sets aren't available, you can build your own. And that's the whole point of this session is how we use media to collect data. A really good example of that is like, you know, how building your own data sets. A really good example of that is COVID because initially there was no national level data set, but at CTV, we manually created a database by pulling in values from all the provinces daily, all the provinces daily. And then when data isn't available, you can try looking into media sources or social media reports. Another data set that I created for the BBC um, was we, we tried to count the number of protesters that were detained in Kashmir um, after it lost its special status. And the way I did that was I did it through going through all of the AFP reports. My source was AFP reports. And then when we did the story, we set that in our methodology. You know, like this data comes from AFP reports. Another interesting project that I did was when the Hong Kong protests started, we used uh, the South China Morning Post as a data source and we were able to collect how many people were, uh, we started to collect, it didn't become a project, but we started to collect how many people were getting arrested at protests, um, at the Hong Kong protests. So this was like happening live as the protests were happening. Every time a news article comes out, we would just like put it into a database. And it's something I learned to kind of do just uh, when when like a big event is happening or news is breaking, just quickly like have a data set on the side and then just keep putting in data from, um, you know, from news articles because it will take the police a very long time to actually release that data or any official data from any sort of like official source will take a very long time for it to come out. But news media, people are there on the ground already writing these reports. So if you can just 
you know, like collect that data while these reports are coming out. It's just, it's all, you already have it, like while it's happening live. And finally, for multilingual projects, um, it's, I mean, I hope that it doesn't deter you from doing multilingual projects, uh, but Google Translate is not the best. It's okay for like quick checks and things like that, but hopefully if you are doing a multilingual project, there will be someone on the team who speaks that language. And, um, and then you can use Google Translate just to do like, you know, quick translate like searches and things like that. And I think that's the end of my little presentation. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Mahima. So we have a few questions. We have time for a few questions here, and we got some queued up. Awesome. Uh, Noura asks, uh, thank you for this super insightful session. Did you have any previous knowledge of Urdu or, for example, and for example, Arabic when you started the project? No, I didn't. That was that was the fun part because I was coming into this with no knowledge of the language and a very like you know minimal knowledge of Afghanistan itself. I learned everything on the go. And um, because luckily I had a team member who spoke who spoke Urdu Pashto, and um, I was able to verify everything and all the language stuff went through them. And then I was doing the data part of the project. Great. And uh, next question is: um, When you sort information and you take it from news to sheets, what if there are some criteria that are missing? Let's say, in the example they give, is that the age of that the age of one victim, for example, is missing, but you know that the news is credible. Do you still include that data or do you exclude it? You st um, I would still include it. And you know, you could just mention in the methodology that the age was missing for so much percentage of your data. Right, so that goes to what you were talking about with fuzzy data, right? Right, yeah, you, you need to be okay with, yeah, having little holes. And yeah, and then you can also, we did, we did um, visualize when we made the visuals, we did add a section called unknown, and then we did visualize that little box as well. Great. And our, our last question before we uh, take a, a break for lunch here uh, is uh, someone asked the, the differences between governmental and extremist death counts. So the hidden hidden and amplified are interesting. Did you pursue this angle at all? Um, not uh, not personally, but BBC monitoring has a whole Team. Um, it's called jihad. It's called the jihadist media group, and that's what they that's what they do. They just cover um, uh, reports from these extremist groups. And that's their main mandate. But yeah, it was very interesting to me also to see to see how staggeringly different the numbers were. But that is a good story idea. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Mahima. Uh, thanks for your time. Thanks yeah. for joining us. And uh, right now we're going to take a one hour break and come back for our at. 1 p.m. Eastern time with our keynote for day two, which is Jimmy Thompson. And uh, we'll uh, see you all then. Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to day two of Data Driven 2021. And I'm pleased to present our uh, second keynote speaker of the conference, uh, Jimmy Thompson. Jimmy Thompson is the uh, managing editor of the Capital Daily in Victoria. Uh, before that, uh, he was the uh, winner of the inaugural uh, Story Lab Data Journalism grant uh, sponsored by the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and a uh, prolific science and environmental journalist, multimedia journalist in his own right. He's worked in every Arctic country reporting on climate change, indigenous communities, wildlife and resources. And his work has appeared in a number of publications, including the CBC, the Narwhal, Vice, the Globe Mail, the Toronto Star, and many others. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Jimmy. Thanks very much, David. Uh, can you hear me all right? Hmm. Yep, you're good. You are okay. good. All right, awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks David and, uh, and and the rest of the organizers at, at Humber who have been working incredibly hard to make all this happen. And thanks uh, anyone watching for, for taking the time to watch this. I want to talk about the intersection of data journalism, field reporting, and working with Indigenous communities. Data can be used to great effect in journalism, as we've seen throughout these presentations. Um, but ultimately, I, I believe the best data-driven stories are still human stories, and they're made available or accessible through data. 
I want to talk about a story I'm still working on, uh, as David mentioned, supported by a grant by the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting and Humber College. It's using data to show how a new kind of stewardship is taking over the west coast of Canada. To do that, reporting has meant doing journalism slightly differently. It's meant a lot of negotiation and patience, and most of all, despite it being a data-driven story, it's required that I report from the field. Um, and I think that's an important thing to consider in, in data journalism is getting into the field, not just for footage, but to get a good grasp of the story. And it has other benefits too that I want to talk about a bit later too. In the meantime, I just want to talk about what I've learned through that still ongoing process. So these are some of the Sigma Data Journalism Award winners and finalists for 2020. This one was from USA Today and the Arizona Republic and the Center for Public Integrity. It was, it was called Copy Paste Legislate, and they parsed thousands of government bills to figure out where they originated. Ultimately, the story was about people's ability to elect leaders who work for them, not for corporations. This one, Troika Laundromat, was made by 17 news and public organizations, and it's about how oligarchs hid their wealth from everyday citizens and avoided taxation or scrutiny of what they were doing. This one, made in France, uh, the organization Disclose showed French-made weapons being used in Yemen against civilians. This one on air pollution from the New York Times visualized the prevalence of air pollution and emphasized its effects on people's health. This one on text neck uh, from South China Morning Post visualized the health and safety impacts of walking around with their faces buried in your phone. So, you know, I could go on and I don't want to belabor the point, but what all these stories have in common and what makes them great, I think, is, isn't just the depth of their data or their beautiful visualizations. You know, those were maybe what made them award-winning stories, um, but I think what really made them special was, was tying that, that data back to human stories, both people responsible for something going wrong or something bad happening, um, and, and who is affected and how. Um, so just a, a quick rundown on, on where I'm coming from. I, I grew up with seeing my parents jet off to northern locales and exotic Canadian uh, bush locales <laughs> as archaeologists. Um, we had a house full of Inuit carvings and prints, and I always wanted to see that, that for myself. And I studied science, uh, sea slug brains to be exact, and, and finally made it to the polar regions as a, as a naturalist and a polar bear guard for expedition cruise ships in the Arctic and Antarctica. Um, eventually, I went and did my master's in journalism at UBC. And there were two courses that I took there that, that I found really valuable um, and that I still rely on uh, the lessons from those courses. The first was the international reporting program and, and that just it taught me about parachute journalism, how to avoid that in particular uh, with with deep research and making local connections before you go. Um, and that also kind of rolled into this other one, the indigenous reporting program and that was taught by Duncan McHugh. And that taught me that reporting in indigenous communities in the Canadian context has to be done slightly differently. Um, gifts, for example, especially for elders and other community leaders are not uncommon. Indigenous nations are independent entities and should be approached as such. And there's an independent, there's an incredibly troubling history of bad journalism about Indigenous peoples in Canada. And so that relationship has a lot of mending to be done. Eventually I went north and worked for CBC. Um, and over, over the six years since then, um, since, since I graduated from, from UBC, seven years now almost, I've had a chance to report from every Arctic country. Um, and I learned that much of Northern journalism is Indigenous journalism. More than half the people in the Northwest Territories where I worked are Indigenous. 86% uh, in Nunavut are Indigenous and mostly Inuit. So uh, I, I went and worked for the Narwhal and I started reporting a lot on Guardians. I just found myself coming back to these stories again and again. They're uh, to, just as a brief primer on what Guardians are. They're, they're essentially the boots on the ground, the eyes and the ears of their communities. They're out there monitoring the land, they're taking water samples, um, carrying out other scientific work. And as it happens, that scientific work that they're doing has been some of the most resilient work throughout the pandemic when scientists couldn't get to remote communities to do their, their field work. They're also a first line of defense for rescues. Um, I've, I've been out with many uh, guardians over, over the years and most of them have had some experience of rescuing kayakers who got swamped or, or um, people who were lost in the bush or, or hunters who had had a, a run in or something like that. There's been all kinds of stories of indigenous guardians um, helping people from outside the territory and within the territory and being being right there. Um, they're monitoring harvesting and they're reporting poaching. 
And most of all, you know, they're, they're asserting an indigenous presence on the land. So guardians rep guardian programs reflect a growing recognition that indigenous peoples are the best stewards of their own lands. So this story that I've got up on, on the screen here, this Daidenanene National Park Reserve in the Northwest Territories, guardians are the, the go-to managers of the park. They do the things that a Parks Canada official might otherwise be doing. I guess, I mean, it makes sense. Why send someone from Calgary or Ottawa to explain the territory when Lutzelke is right there and it's full of knowledgeable, underemployed people? These programs create jobs where there aren't very many. And in Lutzelke, it was basically go work for a mine or I mean, there's a few jobs in town. It's very few um, until this park came along and now it's employing many people from the community. Um, in Australia, Guardians, they call them rangers there, have secured half a billion dollars worth of funding. They're asking for similar levels of funding here. So this could be actually a major piece of the future of Canadian conservation. I was talking to Catherine McKenna um, when I did this story on Thaida Nenene, and she said that she, when she was environment minister, she was saying that um, she sees Guardians being being part of basically every park going forward. So now I'm on Vancouver Island, and that's near the home of Guardians. They, they, they originated in Haida Gwaii in the 1970s, and since then they've spread across along the BC coast, up and down the BC coast, and throughout Canada. And now there's sort of an international network of Guardians, uh, and, and Haida Gwaii is um, one of the sort of originators or one of the the hubs of that of that international network. So this grant, the Pulitzer Center Humber College Story Lab grant, was announced in the fall of 2019, and it's the first time it's been given for data-driven storytelling about Indigenous communities and land. The grant covered travel and data analysis and consultant fees and events and equipment. It was an awesome grant. <laughs> um, I knew Guardians would be perfect for it, but I first had to figure out what story I wanted to pitch. Um, so I decided to approach it through the lens of it being an under-recognized piece of Canada's coastal response and monitoring. Coast Guard and Park Service and military and other government agencies can really only do a fraction of what people on the ground can do if they're given the support they need. So I wanted to go out and find out what the spatial extent of those programs are on the coast and what it actually, if you put it all together, what it, what it looks like and what they're doing. Uh, so when I got that call that I got the grant, it was mid-February of 2020, um, back when everything was normal, if you can think back that far. Uh, I was in Tofino as it happens, and I was playing the game Pandemic. Um, and so I started playing, planning the travel right away because, you know, obviously what could go wrong? So COVID hit, obviously, um, and, but by that time it was clear that I already knew that this was going to be a long process. So um, there are three First Nations involved that I, that I wanted to, to do, uh, that I wanted to talk to for this story. Uh, there was Heltsuk, the Kitasu Hehe, and the Owekino. Um, they're all coastal First Nations. They're all bordering each other along the central coast of, of BC. They have well-established guardians programs, and they have these huge overlapping territories that, that extend from the land into the sea. Um, these red circles are in no way representative of their actual territories. It's just, I just wanted to illustrate that they're big. Um, yeah, these are not, this, that's not accurate, but uh, that's why I needed the data. So guardians go out on patrols uh, on, the, on the land, on the water, and when they're out there, they, they take GPS trackers as well as specific data points along the way, such as, you know, whale sightings or crab traps that aren't supposed to be there, or, or if they're greeting one of the local fishermen or, or a commercial fishermen from outside of the First Nation or, ter or, or tourists or rescuing someone. I, so all kinds of things get logged in their, in, their, um, in their iPads. But that data ultimately belongs to the Guardians and the First Nations. So that meant working with the First Nations to access their data. It belongs to them. Um, we don't really have any right to it. Uh, so I had to negotiate access with three separate First Nations. And that obviously right, required patience because an understanding that this wasn't the biggest thing on their radar. First of all, COVID, but also these are just, these are under-resourced departments with really big responsibilities. So starting in February of last year, um, I only got the last bit of data last month. So now I have the data and, and I've been mapping it out since with, with help from ArcGIS. 
But I wanted to get on the ground. The, the story is driven by data, but it really exists on the land. All three First Nations um, had a great for reason to, you know, to recommend them um, for, for such a visit. So Heltzik is very accessible. It's the largest of the three First Nations, and, and I've been there a number of times, so I'm already familiar with it. I knew people on the ground. Um, but it has also already had a lot of media exposure in the last years, especially in BC media. So I, I thought I'd go a little further afield. Um, Clem 2 is the least accessible, but it had it has still ongoing some incredible work going on with a with a new indigenous sorry a new indigenous protected area in Kitasu Bay, and uh, some really interesting research happening on crabs and bears. And Okino is is somewhat accessible, um, but it also has a ton of great work happening around crab conservation. So I decided on on Okino um, as a good balance of of the three. Of, of those factors. Um, but I knew it wasn't going to be as simple as a typical reporting trip. You know, I, I didn't want to be the person, it would be such a nightmare to be the person to bring COVID to a remote First Nation. I think journalists, especially right now, have the responsibility to be careful, right? And, and because we may think the story is important, but it's probably not essential to the community. So I planned around having the least possible exposures before the trip and, and on the, on my way. So I drove the, the whole length of the island from Victoria to Port McNeil, and then I flew from there in that, that small plane that can land right on the water, um, like right on the belly. It's not it's not like a typical float plane with the floats. It was actually really cool. You could hear the water in the... Anyway, not important. Um, I wore a mask anytime I was indoors when I was when I was there in the, in the community, and, and I did all my interviews at a distance, often outside. Um, sorry, this is a this is a picture of me in the back of a pickup um, because I wasn't allowed inside anyone's vehicles. I actually spent a lot of time that week hopping in and out of the back of pickup trucks. Um, th there were other protocols to follow as well once I arrived. So there was I had to get approvals from the emergency management officer, and and that was a lot of paperwork. But she ended up being a great resource for my work and and uh, for my stories. So I'd, I'd reached out well ahead of time. I put a post on the Facebook community page. If you know uh, remote communities, you know that Facebook ends up being like the de facto newspaper and everything else, um, and, a, and a poster that they printed off for the office. So people would point, you know, stop me on the street and ask if I was the reporter and then offer me some piece of information or a ride somewhere in the back of a pickup truck. Um, and, you know, I, I I also wanted to give something back while I was there. So the grant allowed um, for a for a budget for planning a community meal, hosting sort of a, a, a community event, and that would have been great. And I was really hoping to do that, but COVID obviously meant no gathering. So I provided gift cards uh, for people who took their time to talk to me, um, and just other people in the community, like elders. And you know, that that may sound unfamiliar to traditionalists. And I'm happy to answer questions about this afterwards. Um, but in First Nations, that's one way to make sure that you're not just extracting. I wasn't paying people for their stories, but I was I was thanking people in the community for for hosting me, for having me. I also made sure to follow up with participants in the story after the first one was published. Um, and I offered to speak with the students, but but school hadn't yet started, so that didn't happen. Um, one of the main reasons for my trip was to go out with the Guardians. It, it meant more negotiations around COVID protocols. It, I had to be outside of the boat. Um, the boat has had a tiny little cabin um, and then a, a little out, outside deck space. So at all times I was outside of the uh, outside of the boat and I only got to go out with them once in the week that I was there. Uh, but it was worth it. I, I saw their day to day. I got to build rapport. I got to see what the system is that they put their data into. So, and and how they do that, and how consistently they do that, and 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 what exactly they you know they're they're doing while they do that. So that let me see some of the limitations of their data. For example, if they spotted a whale two kilometers away, they would put it in as you know whale sighting, and then they'd mark down their GPS coordinates. But it could be a blow off in the distance. They don't know exactly how far it is, and that creates a big radius of error, which is fine. Um, it's just nice to see. Um, what those what those uh, limitations are of that data, but it also let me get photos and and scenes for the written part of the story, and and videos. Uh, here's one. I don't know if that's coming through on your screen, but this was a a drone video of of some whales that we spotted going by, and a sea lion there uh, swimming with the whales, and also let me get interviews in the field. So I, I interviewed the guardians 
as they're out doing their jobs rather than you know over the phone or 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 on a visit to Victoria or something like that, which um, just makes the the interview that much better, obviously, for anyone who works in video. So the the, the story is still ongoing. Um, it's as as David mentioned, it's going to be in the narwhal. I have all the data now, uh, and I'm doing a bit of analysis and, and, pre and presentation with ArcGIS, and I'm aiming to tell the story of, of how the Guardian's work began and what it's accomplished since. So please stay tuned for that. It currently looks a bit like this, <laughs> although with three First Nations and their programs. Obviously, there's there's some cleaning up that needs to happen and, and a lot more uh, work that needs to ha happen before it's ready for a story. And, uh, but once it's ready, I'll be going back to the First Nations to clear the maps with them. So that's another part of this sort of compromise that had to happen. I, I've, I've agreed to remove visits to sacred sites or other information that might be sensitive for the First Nations. It's, it's not ideal, but I, it felt like a compromise that had to be reached to get access to the data and, and to be responsible in, in my storytelling here. I'm sure some of you may disagree with that, and I'm happy to talk about it after. But the grant already uh, also already produced one story that I'm extremely proud of. This was called Grizz Grizzlies at the Table, and it used the history of salmon declines to tell a story about a community in crisis. So Okino has already has always been dependent on salmon. It's coexisted with grizzly bears for millennia. The rainforest of the coast where where Okino is has is incredibly closely tied to salmon. As much as 80% of the nitrogen in the trees in that part of the world comes from the deep sea. The salmon cause a reversal of the flow of nutrients downstream, so they return it upstream to the forest. And that whole process depends on eagles and wolves and, and most of all bears. So they, you know, the bears need the salmon to survive themselves, but they also carry the carcasses into the forest and they fertilize the trees. Then the trees in turn uh, shade the streams and they they keep the soil intact. It's just, it's an incredibly intricately connected process, um, but. Salmon is also a valuable commodity. So salmon canneries filled rivers inlet in the, in the 20th century. And meanwhile, logging also destroyed salmon habitat upstream and cut off that regenerative cycle. And the bears starved. So that culminated in a traumatic year in 1999 in which more than a dozen bears had to be shot. Um, I spoke to the man who shot the bears and, and to someone who was mauled by a bear, that's Johnny Johnson there on, on your screen, uh, whose window was cracked the morning I talked to him because a bear had been pounding on his door the night before. So even the, this, this program or this problem exists to this day. So now the community is trying to account for the needs of bears in their fish allocations. They want to put the ecosystems first, so ahead of human needs even. So getting to go there for me was incredibly worthwhile as, as a freelance journalist um, because it, it offered me a chance not only to enhance my first piece, the, the one for the Narwhal, but also to scout for other stories. It was also more worthwhile for the community, I, I think. Um, they had a chance to tell me in person what their priorities are and what they care about. It also brought in some money to the community. You know, I, I stayed at their lodge, I paid for meals and I bought some art. Um, so just to wrap up, I just want to say again, data stories, I, I think at their best are, are human stories. And I've used that data from a scientific perspective, but now using it from a journalistic perspective, in particular, a reconciliation perspective, I, I think that data is incredibly powerful, but what really matters is people. You're cutting off your story at the knees if you're not including the human stories behind it. The, this data in particular from this story is, is born of an interaction between the indigenous community and the land. So telling the story on the ground on the ground is so much more capable of getting at that. If you're not seeing the land, you're not seeing the whole story. So that is my presentation for you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Sure. So I'm going to. Uh, you have questions in our open, so we just got one coming in. So I can just uh, read it to you, Jimmy here. So Mary asks, can you talk about how you get data from indigenous communities? What are your sources? Uh, and she goes on to say that she's done some reporting with Indigenous communities and often data is simply not collected or it's collected sporadically or it's not the most complete because of lack of trust. Any thoughts on how to get numbers around topics that may have incomplete data from official quote unquote or academic sources? That's a, a really good question. I think that that's something that that I'm encountering in this story as well. And I, so I don't think that I have necessarily the answer to it or a satisfying answer to it. Um, this data that, that I'm looking at, as I said, it has serious limitations, um, most of which 
come from the the way that it's collected. Um, th these people are there's only it's a, it's a small team in this case of of two people, three people, and they've got a lot on their plate um, and limited sort of technology to do that. So the the data is is collected. Um, I wouldn't say sporadically, and and some of the data is is really complete, but it's not it's not perfect. Um, yeah, I mean, I I also know that there are a number of scientists working uh, in in these communities, and the ones that are doing the best job are working very closely with the communities, um, working with people in the communities. So they, I I would say possibly it could be it could be working with scientists who have the best connections with the communities. Um, as their as their research programs go along, I'm, I'm working on another story on one of these communities in the coast, um, and I'm already sort of in touch with the. I've been in touch with them for six months now, the, the scientists, to try and get ready for for a visit out to the field. Great, and uh, Natisha is asking, uh, is photography also one of your mediums for the story? Yeah, photography is. So the the photos from the presentation there were were. Um, some of them were from the the story that I did for Beside, which which um, was a photo, partly a photo story, and the Narwhal story will also include photo and video, um, drone photo and 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 video and and then um, yeah other regular video <laughs> and photos. Can you uh, can you talk, Jimmy? This is my question. Can you talk a little bit about the the kit that the uh, guardians had with them? You mentioned drone drone surveillance. So I was I was I just wasn't imagining them using drones, although it makes sense when I think about it for more than two seconds. Like, can you explain kind of what their their research kit is when they go out? Yeah. Um. So the the drone footage was actually mine. Um. But they I, I have heard of guardians using drones, and I think it I mean, it makes a lot of sense. They've got a huge area to patrol. Uh. These guys were out on a boat. That that I mean the boat itself probably they, they were they were eager to upgrade. Um. But their research kit was they they have um scientific instruments some of them do do uh oceanographic uh research so they'll they'll be taking sample water samples from different ocean strata um they'll be taking temperature measurements um all, all this stuff is tied to gps obviously um the, these guys were doing a crab survey so they're out sort of ca catching and, and measuring crabs to see what the what the state is of their um of their local crab fishery to, to see if if it's able to be harvested. Um, what else? I mean, they're, they're, the Coastal First Nations share a, a data platform. So they all have this iPad based uh, platform and I'm not sure what all metrics can go into it, but, but uh, a lot of it is just sort of hand input. And I think that's a, a bit of a limitation for you know, what I was saying with the whales. Um, and other sightings, it just kind of goes in all as like the notes from the day and and where they saw things. So it's it's not the most sophisticated equipment all the time, but some of them are doing really complicated stuff like uh, environmental DNA. I know that there are uh, uh, guardian programs up in the north that collect water samples for environmental DNA analysis so they can see what creatures are living in that water or around the water. Wow. So. I guess uh, now, how long has been, has you mentioned that this is kind of, you knew this story was going to take a long time. So uh, how long would you say, you've, I asked I asked Tom Cardoso for those who've been watching this uh, since the morning, I kind of asked if you could like break break down kind of the time and how you spent it over the course of this in, investigation and, and how, how much longer you think it is uh, going to go. And, and, and I say that not as just the person who helped commission the story, but uh, also just uh, just to get an idea of, of how long these take. Yeah, I mean, so I had originally, let me think, there, were, there was something that I was kind of laughing about the other day where I don't remember what what the exact timeline was that I had thought. I, I mean, I, rem I remember that my, my travel was initially planned for March, so that obviously didn't happen. Um, the travel got pushed way back, and at the same time, I just started negotiating for access to the data. Um, eventually, I did the the travel in September, but even then, I didn't have the data from all three First Nations. So I think the first at least four or five months was spent just kind of back and forth, figuring out who the best person to talk to was, um, getting their trust, 
getting them to to agree to some kind of data sharing agreement on 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 terms that that vary between the First Nations, but are essentially all um, some kind of like you know they 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 get a, a final view of the maps that we use, not the story, but the maps. Um, so yeah, that that's been the bulk of the story at this point. Um, what's happening is is um, going through the the data to to make it as I as you as you saw the data is still in pretty rough shape. It needs to be uh, pretty up before anyone's going to want to look at it. And then extracting some inf in, some worthwhile information about like at this point they saw um, a poacher, or at this point they rescued someone, or at this point they saw whales, um, and just sort of having like a day in the life kind of thing in there. So that's that's the next step is cleaning up the data and writing out my draft, which I'm 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 part way through as well. And then there's going to be sort of tacking on uh, the not tacking on, but it, it, uh, slotting in sort of video elements as well and photo elements. And Mary had a, a kind of follow up. She agrees with you about uh, the reciprocal reporting among indigenous communities, but she also asked, have you ever had to argue for this or explain this to uh, editors slash uh, funders? How, how did you go about those conversations? That's a good question. I, I the Pulitzer Center was incredibly, Pulitzer Center and Humber College, David, um, were, were incredibly uh, supportive of this. I never had an, an issue with this uh, throughout this um, the, this grant pro process and the Narwhal as well. Um, so I, I had worked with UBC's global reporting program on a project up in the north called uh, Turning Points, and, and it was pioneering an approach that they called empowerment journalism of, of giving people uh, a lot of control, like an incredible, unprecedented amount of control over their stories. And, and essentially, we were trying to help them create the story that represented what they wanted to tell about their own history with with alcohol use and 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 in their family or or themselves. And I've kind of br I, I I didn't exactly bring that approach because this story isn't isn't as sensitive as as something like alcohol use in First Nations and something that hasn't been as poorly reported in in the media as as alcohol use in First Nations. Um, but I still I, that that approach sort of informed this this approach as well of knowing that this is their data and and working closely with them. So I didn't have any pushback on it from from the narwhal. Um, it didn't really require anything like that for Beside Magazine with this story. To be honest, I, I don't think I've ever had pushback from an editor on this. I, I, I think that most editors now are, are pretty understanding that this is um, that this is like in in the, the the TRC call to action. There are direct calls to action from media, and uh, a new approach from media has been has been needed for for some time. And um, we have another question here. How long did it take you? As, as a whole to research and, and make a story, I guess, working with the data, I guess you're maybe still that's still ongoing and, and which teams worked with you? Uh, uh, so how long is yeah, it's still ongoing. Um, so almost a year now uh, from the from the in inception of the idea. Um, but well, hopefully, hopefully around a year. <laughs> we'll see. It's still it's it, yeah. Um, I found myself in a in a in a full time editor role, so so doing such an intensive pro pro project off the side of my desk has also proven to be a challenge in the last uh, little while. But but now I have everything I need, so or most of everything I need. So um, is, it, is it just you, or are there are you working with anyone else uh, right now to help you with it, or? So I'm going to be passing on some of the the the. Layout stuff to the Narwhal has a, a, a amazing graphic designer who or a, a web designer who's going to be working on sort of putting the elements together. Um, and ArcGIS has, or sorry, um, S3 ArcGIS people have been have offered me uh, and and made Ming Si Ho incredibly uh, like available it, to to help me sort of work with stuff. And and she's done just an amazing job of of. Um, at cleaning up the data or, or helping me on the, the sort of placing the data in a, in a way that makes sense on on these maps. So that's that's been invaluable to me. What's been your uh, proficiency kind of coming to the story? You know, this is you know, there's obviously so much on the ground reporting and, and stuff that is normally I would say 
from what you've described of, of your background, like in your kind of wheelhouse, how, how much experience have you had working on a, a data driven story before this? Um, I had worked on data driven stories. I had not worked with a lot of like stories where the the data is the is the core of the story and, and sort of shapes the the as you go through the story, you keep on coming back to the data. I've done a lot of sort of stories based on data sets that and then use that data. And you know, I guess that's that's part of this this conference is the one half. And then we're not we're not I haven't done a lot of like data viz or um, and and so half of this pro this project is data viz. So that's that's been sort of the one of the bigger uh, complications for me. Um, as an environment journalist, I found uh, data um, data journalism techniques to be really valuable to me, but it, it it hasn't been like the core of my work. You brought up towards you know at the beginning of the presentation talking about gifts and and how that might be counterintuitive to certain. Uh, journalist. So because no one's really asked that question, I wanted to play the straw man and, and just say, I mean, I thought that we're not supposed to give uh, people <laughs> any incentives to speak to us. And wouldn't that be some, seen as some sort of coercion? Yeah, for sure. I, I, that That is a question that I would have expected um, and that, you know, that we should be asking. But so first of all, I, I, I never, um, I didn't actually tell people ahead of time that there was a, a gift that I was going to be giving them in exchange for, or it wasn't in exchange for talking to, it was just that I was going to be giving them after talking to me. Um, and I also gave gifts to people who didn't talk to me. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was, it was, gift giving is is uh, sort of a different ballgame in, in Indigenous uh, culture, in some some Indigenous cultures. Um, and especially with elders, it's, they're, their time is very valuable and their knowledge is very valuable. So it's it's giving something back. Um, it's certainly not not a, a way of uh, coercing or, or or encouraging people to talk to me. It's it's more just trying to uh, to thank them for their time. And were there any other um, I guess other processes or or ceremonies or things that you were privy to there besides I guess engaging in in gift in in gift giving in this sense? Um, no, I mean, well, ceremony wise, like they're, they're, they couldn't even have funerals that week. This is another thing that, that was going on that week. There were two people who had died recently um, when I was there and that was, uh, that made it a, a pretty, a pretty raw time to be there. Um, and they couldn't even have funerals because of COVID. So there was nothing in, in that sense. I, I have in that community, I've been into that community before and, and the last time I was there, you know, uh, we were welcomed with, with a, a, a ceremony. It was a gorgeous ceremony uh, in their big house. This time there was, like I was in the big house a couple times to take pictures and to do an interview, um, but there was nobody in there. Like there, it was, there was no, um, there's nothing happening in the community that week. It just, it, people were, it was, it was full full swing COVID times. It was, I guess it was sort of a lull. It was September, so it was a bit of a lull in the COVID uh, uh, numbers out here, but you know, it, it was still just, the, the protocols were still very high and uh, yeah, the, the deaths in the community had really slowed everything down. And uh, if, maybe just to give us a bit of an idea, like what like a sense of this community that, that you were in there, like what, what's the size of it? Uh, what's the population like just when, what's it like to, and how is that different, let's say, from reporting in, uh, I guess, where the work that you do now for the Capital Daily, right? Yeah, I, I think it's about 65 people. I might be getting that wrong. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the dozens, you know, like the, it's, it's a low number. The kind of number where if someone leaves, you notice in the in the in the, in the population. Um, so, and the, but then there's also people outside of the community uh, in in Port Hardy. So, uh, you know, I drove up to Port Hardy, and while I was there, I met with an elder and and another guy who the guy who had shot the uh, the bears in 2000 and, or in um, 1999. He he now lives in Port Hardy. So the we can know people are are spread across the the region a little bit but yeah in the in the actual community in the village it's about 65 people uh, give or take so it's <laughs> it's very different it's really uh, it was kind of funny you know you'd, you'd be talking to someone doing a whole interview and then you'd mention oh yeah and i was talking to to george last 
or yesterday and he's like oh yeah that's my uncle you know and then that it was always always people were were quite closely related um everyone not only knows everyone but knows everything about everyone um which also makes for a really interesting storytelling because you're bouncing people's stories off of each other um and they all know the stories uh, they're all they're all sort of interconnected and they can all not only corroborate but also offer a whole new perspective on, on each other's stories which you don't get in a bigger community like like i do for capital daily and uh mary also ha had uh, another question she said are you doing any engagement work after this project is over to make sure that the communities you wrote about see the results yeah absolutely that that's part of it um uh like i did with the the um Besides story, I'll be I'll be sharing the story with them, but also uh, it'll be a bit more in depth because I'm actually I'm I'm going to have to clear the maps as I mentioned with with the community um, to make sure that I'm not I'm not sharing any sacred sites or anything like that. Um, and I I would like to you know, and I don't think I'll be able to visit the communities again, uh, just partly because of COVID and partly because of budget, but. I, I would I'll definitely be uh, be in touch with the, the resource coordinators who who shared the the data with me and and uh, anyone who spoke with me. Oh, sorry, David, you were muted, I think. So I mean, is there anything then that I mean, what's your kind of takeaway now from from I mean the work? I know you're not done the project yet, but how is this? I mean contributed to to your knowledge of, of reporting on it, indigenous peoples and as well as uh what, what would you what advice would you give to people uh who want to go and do similar data-driven stories in these communities um yeah so it it's informed my my uh means of of, of working in indigenous communities in that it's I had never done data driven journalism in indigenous community before, uh, but they are they are collecting this data uh, in a lot of cases and not just guardians programs, but other resource um, resource management offices and other other sort of parts of, of wings of the uh, of the First Nations. I mean, and that's just talking about environment journalism. There's also health journalism and and um, you know other I, I don't know there, there's there, there are other uh, databases out there that are man maintained by First Nations but you have to get that permission you have to um win the community's trust and 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 live up to that as well so that's that's probably the advice that i would give is is if you want to do journalism around indigenous communities um make those connections with indigenous communities um do do lots of work around around reporting responsibly um, on Indigenous communities. Uh, the reporting in Indigenous communities um, uh, course, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to try and send you, David, the uh, the link to that. Um, but that, that course that is now, now run by Chantal Balrichard um, at, at UBC, they, they maintain a website that has all kinds of great resources for people who want to report in Indigenous communities. Um, so that that's kind of, that would be a good starting place. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a lot of relationship building, and people don't, you know, they don't they don't they're not obligated to talk to you. They're not obligated to to share any information with you. So, I guess giving them a reason to want to talk to you would would be a, a good start. Great. Well, uh, yeah, you can if you sent once you send me that link, I can post it into the Q and N A chat after. Uh, and I'm just waiting a second to see if anyone's just getting their last minute questions in. But I think uh, you've done a great job answering uh, the ones that have been put forward so far. So I'd just like to say uh, thank you, Jimmy, uh, for yeah, for, for doing this and speaking and, and looking forward to uh, the finished uh, Guardians of the Coast uh, when it's published, when you get around to it. But I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, uh, no, but no, I'm, I'm honestly uh, really uh, excited to see uh, the final product. And uh, thanks so much. And uh, you can catch uh, Jimmy's work in the meantime uh, as the editor of the Capital Daily in uh, Victoria. It's in Victoria, right? Victoria, BC. Victoria. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks like thanks very much, David.
yeah, no problem. And uh, we'll be back uh, here at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. <laughs>
Um, first of all, um, a little bit background and introduction of this project and how I come up with the idea. And we all know Joe Biden um, took the White House as the 46th uh, president of the United States last week. And I think in Canada, all, all the rest of the world, we were looking at the rioting, the riots and chaos in Washington, D.C. Um, just a few days before the inauguration. And we kind of forgot, we kind of forgot that the 2020 U.S. presidential election started from a very, very crowded stage. And if you can search the news, in the very beginning, there were 30 candidates announced their running and 20, 27 Democrats and three Republicans. And so with so many, so many candidates in a race, how to get attention from the public and how to talk to the constituents is very important for their nomination. Except the uh, exposure from the from the mainstream media, social media, social media are the main platform for for them to express their political opinions, set their agendas, and and talk directly to the public. So, as a data journalist, my day to day job is to find patterns and trends by analyzing numerical data. And, and the data can, can be a tabular format or in a special format. Um, but I never, I never did analysis on, on, on tax, especially large amount of tax. So therefore, I was wondering why that can I do the same type of analysis, like on the tax data. Um, these data was generated by those uh, politicians on social media. So hopefully, I can identify something interesting such as like their rhetoric patterns or their social media user habits some of the some of the interesting traits that that they probably like they've never found before also i want to know that if there are any subtle or uh, obvious similarities or differences between each candidates so i can i can actually carry out this project in a very old fashioned way I can collect all their tweets, I can print them out, read through all of them, and highlight some useful content for my analysis. But remember, this is like a lot of candidates. And my sample ha my, my, my final sample has like 32,000 tweets. In average, each tweet is like 100 English words. So that add up to 4 million English words. That's equal to reading. 10 very big novel books. So it's quite impossible. It's going to take me forever. So this is when NLP comes in handy. And so next, I'm going to walk you through this project um, step by step. Um, I divided the whole project into four steps. The first, of course, as this is a data driven project, I need to get the data. And then after getting the data, I want to look at the data like initial, like took an initial analysis of the data. I call I call this step as observing the data through a, a telescope, like from a bigger picture. And the third step, I want to like look at like from a closer distance. I call it like through a microscope. And at last, um, I want to produce something that I can share with the with the internet or other other people. And so this is um, this is the divide the whole project into four steps, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk uh, each steps. But remember, this is a, this is just a sharing. This is not a tutorial, so I will not go into very very details about the project. Okay, so um, for any project, I think defining a clear and manageable scope is very important at the very beginning. Um, particularly the case, it is, is the case for this project. It's infeasible to collect all the social media from the 30 candidates. So I decided to focus on the just the front runners. Um, I think I would like to look at the top five candidates who have the highest. Like, remember, I did that in like uh, the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020. At the time, the only like um, index I can use is the polling results. So I select the five candidates with the highest polling rankings. And unsurprisingly, the top five candidates also has the most 
uh, the largest uh, Twitter followers. And by the time, but by the time I start to collect the data, Kamala Harris, you can um, point pointer. You can see from here, this is the polling results. I put them in a bar chart. And just by the time I start to collect the data on Twitter, Kamala Harris uh, announced uh, to drop out. So um, I end up with uh, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, and Andrew Young. And so the tool I used is Twitter's API. Uh, this is probably the most handy and natural tool when it comes to collect data from Twitter. And you, you can basically use it to stream, uh, you can use to stream uh, real-time uh, data, or you can collect all the attributes uh, of uh, historical tweets from any account. Um, but Twitter's API comes with a, with a big limit in terms of collecting old tweets uh, that you can, you can only collect uh, 3,000-ish tweets from any account uh, from any account. Um, I don't know if like Twitter did that on purpose, but it's definitely um, a big problem for me at the very beginning because uh, 3,200, 3, like 30,000 ish sounds a lot, but you can imagine if you are had, if you there's a very active Twitter user who tweets like 20 or 30 times a day, this limit can only collect a very, very small portion of the data sample. So um, I just come, I just came, I came up with a kind of a bandage solution. I collected the data twice with, uh, with one month in between. Um, then I merged the two data sets from two times collection and I removed the duplicates. So eventually I end up with uh, 32,255 tweets from the from the five candidates. So this is like the data collection um, step, which came a little bit harder than I imagined. Okay, so let's go back a little bit about NLP, natural language processing. Um, a toolkit can do the job, basically splits up a whole document into smaller units, such as a, a word, a sentence, or a, a paraphrase. Then it analyzes the connections between each unit and detects the patterns based on uh, statistics and numbers. For, for data journalists, I think uh, we can take the advantage of natural language processing because it turns a large chunk of, of unstructured textual data into a data-driven structure that would, we are, we're all used to dealing with. And um, so this is where I start my second step. Okay. So I said, I want to do some initial analysis on my data. I want to look at the data from a bigger picture, from a relatively longer, far away distance. And a much more formal name of this step is called an exploratory data analysis or EDA. And the EDA can explore and visualize data in order to summarize some of the main characteristics of the data set. And most importantly, it can figure out if the data I just collected can make sense. And for, for this project, I, use a, I used an exploratory data analysis to, to generate a whole of numerical information based on the tweets that I just collected. And for example, I, I, had, a, I had a column that counts, counts the, how many words each tweet contain, contains, and in at last, I have an average low, average tweet length of every candidate. And also I quantify how each candidate interact with other user, with other Twitter users and how the how the public give them feedbacks and, and also like when and which day they like to tweet more and the which day they tweet less. Something just like this. I found this is very useful. Like um, it's great for data visualization or to get a general, a bigger picture of your data, and so the I'm very, I was very, very happy with the final results because I, there's some like interesting findings I would like to share with you. And in terms of the of the length of each tweet, and um, Andrew Young and Joe Biden tend to keep their tweets short, and you can see from here, while uh, Elizabeth Warren and um, Bernie Sanders, they like to 
they like to send out long tweets. And Bernie Sanders tweets like clearly appeal to a larger crowd um, on Twitter because his tweets received the most uh, the most uh, likes and retweets comparing to the other five. I think he's like he has he's a natural on the Internet. And I think the recent the recent uh, inauguration meme of Bernie Sanders went viral can, can, can tell can tell the same story. Well, this this is like the most surprising findings to me. He found that while well, Bernie Sanders being the king on Twitter, Andrew Young is is the most savvy user of internet language, and he knows how to talk like millennial and all the Z generation on on the internet. Uh, because you can see, like uh, this is like the, the the amount of the amount of usage of emoji hashtag and mentions on on the tweets. Andrew Young like is far beyond the other people. Like he. Over 60% of tweets contains emojis or hashtag and mention. He he really liked to interact with um with uh, with people um, on his Twitter. And the last of finding I think is some like um is some some common trends among all the five candidates. Like uh, all of them tends to tweet more during the during the debate during the debate dates and. I think this is a, this is quite, probably a very common strategy for any political campaigns, and that kind of makes sense. So, um, this is a brief introduction about the the first level uh, data analysis. So, after the the EDA, wa I wanted to perform some uh, like higher level analysis that can helps understand the data from a a, mic a micro level. So, I call it like see the data through a microscope. And I wanted to train a I want because the data is is big enough, so it's it's a perfect size to train a machine learning algorithm or a model. Um, I in, I designed this model to uh, read a lot all the like a lot of tweets, so it can automatically recognize its author. So by training this model, the computer can um, detect some more. Um, subtle characters or features of each candidate's, candidate's Twitter rhetorics and, and lexicons like the vocabulary, the sentiment, the combination of words. So therefore, this project is now like turns into a um, classification machine learning model training that can be finished in, in three steps. And first, I have to put the data into the right format, which is called pre-processing. And then I'm going to use the data to train a model, a machine learning model. And then at last, I'm going to evaluate the model and trying to, to interpret the results. So uh, warning, there's going to be a lot of like, um, there's going to be a lot of uh, technical jargons, but I'm going to try to explain them in, in plain language. Um, although like a natural language processing can apply to many different functionalities, and it can be used for uh, various uh, purposes. And how it pre-processes data doesn't vary much. Um, for every application, you always need to um, tokenize your documentation. You have to stamp or uh, lamentize, lament, lament, lamentize your um, each your documentation and reduce some of the noises. I'm not going to talk about them in like in details. And so uh, as tokenization. As, as humans, we read a piece of text by scanning the text and a comprehend between the lines. But the computer needs to divide the text into small units, uh, for example, into each word, like cut, cut, cut. And tokenization chops a document into words. Uh, this word is called a token. And then counts how many, how many tokens appeared in the whole document. Then it turns this whole document into a document and term matrix. This is an example. And the data on the top is the original data that I collected. It has two columns. One column is the one column is the the, the author and the other is the, what he tweet. Uh, what is he or she tweeted? And this is a two by two by five uh, data set. And after the tokenization, and um, you can see it turns into a 55 by five uh, big data set. 
Each column is a unique word appeared in the whole document, like the five tweets. And every row is the, the, is the author and every cell is the value of the word counts. So this is just only five tweets, like a few sentences. And um, it turns into a 55 columns data. Um, imagine if I have, um, I have like 32,000 tweets. And if I tokenize the whole data, I'm going to end up with a, a data set with like thousands of tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of, of columns because they're going to use a lot of words. And this size of data is going to slow down the computer storage drastically. And even worse, they're going to reduce any like model, model training accuracy. And this is basically kind of a trash. And so I have to keep wrangling with the data. And so then it comes to the STEMI and uh, lemmatization. If you have linguistic background, this is probably something not new to you. And uh, uh, STEMI and uh, lemmatization basically means uh, return the, the English word into its original root. Uh, for example, um, car, cars, car apostrophe as cars apostrophe they all mean the same to a computer so they're going to return that into car and so in this way it's going to reduce the unique count of the whole documents and also it means reduce the the number of columns in my in my data set and after that i keep reducing the columns and the less parameters i have um the sleek my, uh, my my data could be and the more accuracy I'm looking at. Um, if you are noise reductions, um, I think they have a better name in data science for that. But I came up with the name because I think in photography, if you reduce the noises, you're going to improve the photo quality. And in NLP, um, there are a lot of like in, in our uh, natural language, there are a lot of like stop words they appears a lot like um, and is he or she something like that and it doesn't mean a lot when it comes to a uh, textual analysis and also remember i got this data from the internet there are a lot of like, urls and html codes and also emojis and a lot of like non-alphabetic um, words um, they are also inside the data but they they can be quite useless when it comes to um, data analysis and model training. So I have to remove all of them as well. And so this basically, this is the data processing, um, data pre-processing step. And this is, this surprised me because uh, I thought this is a clean, this is like the data cleaning and the data wrangling should be the easiest part of the whole process. But it surprised me that this job actually took me the longest time. Um, because I think as a any like data practitioner, either you're a reporter, you're working for the media or you're working for um, like um, startups as a as a developer, data developer or a data scientist. The last scenario, the worst thing you want for your project is uh, trashing trash out. So. I think it worth the time. And so after the data in a better shape, it's it's ready to to fit in a model. Um, I use the model called a naive Bayes classification model. It's it's not naive at all, <laughs> and um, I won't go into details about like statistical uh, reasons of this model. Uh, but I want to be specific about the workflow of of my my model. And so I'm gonna feed in uh, thousands of tweets, let the model to read it. So it can detect the lexicon patterns and the rhetoric styles of each authors using the tokenized uh, the app data. And after learning all the tweets, when I show a new tweet, the model can pre predict who wrote it. So to streamline this job, I wrote a function to tokenize and clean the new data. And then this new data can be fitted into the trained model and the model will predict the pro probability uh, of five uh, candidates and then return the candidates who has the highest pro uh, probability. Um, so this is a whole process that can be automated with just a few 
few lines of, of Python code. So this is a much, it's actually this is a much easier job than, than cleaning the data. And, and I think it's, it's very worthwhile to take a look at the accuracy and precision rate. It didn't, eva it didn't only evaluate the model and also it also gave a lot of like information about, um, about the candidates. And for example, you can see that um, uh, this is like accuracy. This line is the accuracy. You can see that Bernie Sanders uh, correctly predicted 81% of um, tweets from Bernie Sanders. Um, I try to explain that in into. I try to understand that from two perspectives. First, I think because he has most distinct distinctive uh, styles on Twitter, and second of all, uh, he the whole data set, the whole data. Um, I think he has the most tweets in the whole data, and that's why um, my model learned more from him, and therefore it has a higher accuracy rate on him. And the second interesting interesting finding is that um, among all the five candidates, the model has a higher chance to confuse tweets from uh, Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg. Um, to be honest, this really surprised me, and I. I tried to talk to some people and and figure out why to, to give me an explanation. A lot of people thought that because um, among the five of them, um, Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg, they are the less progressive Democrats among the five of them. Um, but I, I probably need to talk to a political scientist or somebody who's familiar with, very familiar with American politics and politicians to to verify this guess. And so um, I hope uh, David can can share this with uh, with the audience. Um, the end the I wanted to to share the pro pro product with more people. So um, I decided to deploy the model to to the Internet. Um, I kind of designed it as a I want to like um, make it more fun to use. So I designed it as a Twitter guessing game. And I'm just like sorry about the really sketchy user interface. This is like designing is really not my background. It, it, it cost me a lot of time to to figure out how to put them into a into a web application, like how to develop an app. And so I decided that I designed it as a Twitter guessing game. And so a user can can type in anything or enter a tweet in the box and you can press the submit button. And then they're going to return you with with its guess. So this is a demo of um, Joe Biden's tweets he he sent out one day before the inauguration. I basically copy paste all the paragraph in here. I put it into the input box. I submit it. So the the app tells me that uh, this is probably higher probability. This is from Joe Biden's. So it's it's a pretty good guess. And if you want to play with it, and remember like the longer your your input is the if you want to test it like the longer the tweet the higher accuracy if you let just type three words um it's probably just like uh, it won't be that effective and lastly i want to share some um some of the takeaways i learned uh, by working on this project and so we've seen actually we've seen in recent years we've seen more uh, data journalists using natural language processing for uh their reporting so therefore, is the thing there's a I noticed there's a new type of data journalism. It's called tax as tax as data journalism. And for example, I noticed that the like New York Times used the NLP to analyze the State of the Union address from from each president. And the LA Times they you they found uh, thousands of underrated crimes by the LA PD by by analyzing how the police describe each crime and how they label label the crime. And the Atlantic uh, spotted complaints related to harmful to harmful uh, medical devices by teaching the computers to read piles and piles of complaints and documentation documents uh, from the FDA. So the first that therefore the first lesson I've learned is that um, text as data journalism can provide more opportunities for for newsrooms and to identify and actual extract newsworthy patterns. Well, this is a particularly very useful tool for 
for independent and freelancing journalists like me, um, because we don't have many chance to collaborate with high profile data providers and or some of them are working in an environment that doesn't have a like data rich government or it's very, very challenging to access to government's data. Um, but um, there are there are a lot of tax data on on the internet that you can you can you can get get some insights from. Um, the second lesson I learned is that although there's a massive amount of tax out there on the internet or from any type of uh, documents, it's not always easy to to get whenever you want. Um, take my case for for instance, if I want to collect all the tweets from each candidate, I have to figure out a way to bypass. Twitter's API's limit, which which can be a very um, challenging challenging issue for me. And so, still now these days, I I couldn't figure out a, a better way to do that. Um, the third lesson is that um, you always 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 want to clean your data. Higher chances that we collect the textual data from the internet and the the data from this source can be very messy. Uh, without cleaning, the, the data won't make much sense and the following analysis is, is just a waste of time. Um, the, the next lesson I learned that um, like um, this type of data journalist, you don't have to always end up with a fancy uh, machine learning model and um, just by visualizing and uh, like do some initial analysis um, on the data, on the textual data, you can you can you can find some really interesting findings that are very underreported. And I also learned that um, if you generate results from a machine learning model or any algorithm, you will face a bigger challenge of interpreting the results to your to your colleagues, to your editors, or most importantly to your to your own audience. Um, especially these days, like the AI and machine learning is so advanced. Some of the some of the algorithm is super powerful. It's very fast and accurate to do anything. Uh, but they're just like they're just like a black box and very few people can explain what was happening and why it's happening. I, I think this is one of the reasons there's still a lot of like ethical conversations around the combination of, of um, high level AI and journalism and also public services. And the last lesson I, I learned that um, using using the natural language processing techniques can be very uh, tech driven and this probably can discourage a lot of um, journalists and reporters who doesn't who don't have a very strong computer science background. Um, my experience is that um, trying to get help from um, professional machine learning data scientists or, or people working in this field. And I noticed that like uh, by working on this project, independent project, I was very glad to meet some um, folks from the machine learning and data science communities in Toronto. It's actually a very, very dynamic and active community. And they're all like sh very willing and open to collaborate with, uh, with journalists or any other folks who have interest in what they're doing. So um, yeah, so this is my it, this is the end of my uh, presentation. And if you want, I think uh, David shared the shared the the end product from me. And you're welcome to play with it. It's on the third party server, so it can be a little bit slow. So be patient with it. And this is my contact if you want to collaborate or if you want to learn more about um, the, the the work that I did. I'm I'm I'm. Feel free to contact me. Thank you. Yay. Great, thanks a lot, Yang. And obviously, so that took a we we're a little bit over time, but that's oh, totally sorry. cool. We have a, no, we have a buffer. So if uh, I'll say, if there's anyone that does have a question right now, I'll just take the first question uh, because uh, then we gotta prepare for the next session. Okay. But, uh, thanks so much, uh, Yang. Oh, that was yeah. That definitely you could do. We should just have a whole conference just for you, just to sit down and explain that uh, yeah. step by step. Okay. You, you know what? I think that you did such a good job explaining it that no one has any questions. So, okay. With that in mind, I'm going to say thanks so much. Uh, Thank you. For, yeah, for joining us today, and we're going to take a quick break and come back uh, at 2:45 Eastern time. So, thanks.
All right, everyone. Hello, welcome back to Data Driven 2021. Next up, we have fan favorite of Data Driven, uh, Niall Shab. I don't think I've ever pronounced your last name correctly, so I apologize. <laughs> start today. Uh, Niall is a, a data journalist for CBC Radio Canada. After uh, several years as a TV reporter, he decided to learn how to code, and now he teaches all of us how to code. And generally, code circles around pretty much most people. He uses Python for data analysis and JavaScript to create interactive uh, data visualizations. So welcome, Niall. Thank you very much. It's great to be back at Data Driven. <laughs> yeah, not, not quite as good now that there's no hors d'oeuvres, but it's, uh, we'll, we'll make do. So uh, just uh, a note, Niall's going to be showing us a bunch of uh, data viz, and I've posted in the Q&A a link to the portfolio so you can follow along as well. So please uh, take it away, Niall. All right. Well, hello everyone. Uh, as David said, uh, I'm a data journalist for CBC Radio Canada. I work for the French services of CBC Radio Canada, so Radio Canada, uh, but I often publish uh, in both French and English. And uh, I code in Python to do my data analysis, data gathering, um, and I could also in JavaScript to create interactive uh, projects, of data visualizations. And I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of uh, the projects my team uh, published in 2020. So, of course, I guess you see my screen now. Yes, David, do you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, it works. All right. So, of course, um, COVID-19 happened in 2020 and it became a huge part uh, of our daily work. Uh, the first thing we did in uh, around mid-March, uh, we published uh, a dashboard allowing readers to follow day after day the pandemic in Canada. We realized that the, there was a need to compile data from all provinces, uh, up-to-date data, a verified data, um, and to publish that uh, very quickly. And uh, very quickly it became uh, the most read uh, story ever uh, on the website. Uh, at Radio Canada, um, and we keep uh, we keep updating it um, since today. Uh, we've been working on it; it's been almost a year, and we keep uh, maintaining it. Um, if you want to check, we have so that's the the French version. Let me switch to the English one, and. Uh, Week after week, month after month, we kept adding a new variables. So we have the reported cases, recoveries, death, but we also added hospitalization, ICU. Uh, I added also vaccination, uh, injected doses, delivered doses. The testing, all of this data is maintained, updated for all province and territories. And it was very complicated to build that. <laughs> Since we're in Canada, uh, health uh, is a provincial uh, responsibility. Um, so if you want to know the number of hospitalizations uh, in Canada, you actually have to scrape to gather the data uh, on each province website and compile all, all of that, then do the sum, and the sum will be the number for Canada because there is no official um, compiled data set right now, for example, for number of tests or hospitalizations. So we had to create um, a system to create that. And what you're seeing here on the left, uh, on the right, uh, it's a, a code, for example, the, the beginning of the code for uh, the web scraper uh, for the province of Quebec. There's uh, web scrapers for each provinces. Basically, it's a small a computer program that goes on uh, a province website and grabs the number of cases, deaths, hospitalizations, everything that we want. Um, and on the left, you have the structure, actually, uh, the architecture of our system. So you have the scrapers for each provinces feeding a big spreadsheet. And this spreadsheet is connected to a database that is then connected to an API. And the API sends all of the information to all the readers and all of our COVID projects. And these small scrapers um, are running every two minutes, um, all the time, every two minutes. So every two minutes, I have uh, a check on all of the websites uh, in Canada to be sure that I have the latest um, information. They also perform all kind of verification to be sure that it's the right number. 
um, and that we're not publishing anything weird, even if sometimes it happens. And we've been correcting the scrapers since day one because the website of the provinces uh, keep changing all the time as as long as there's um, there is new data uh, coming in. So the dashboard was a big part of our work and it's still live. Um, I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen. Yes. Um, but after we compiled all of this data, then we were able to create other projects. Uh, we made a vaccine tracker. Uh, I also created another project based on the same data than the dashboard. Uh, I'm going to switch for the English version. Okay, it's the English version uh, that allow uh, the readers to create their own charts. For example, this is the Canadian provinces, but if you want to compare American states and uh, Canadian provinces with the confirmed cases per 100,000 people, you're able to do so. You're able to download data. You're able to add favorites, uh, to uh, name filters, and to keep it for the, your next visit on the web page. So we created also this kind of uh, web page so people are able to build their own views and their own uh, chart. Then that was the, the basic setup for the pandemic. We knew that people were able to get the numbers every day uh, and also to create their own chart. Uh, I was able then to switch uh, to uh, different uh, projects. Um, I did a project about the movements between provinces uh, and uh, between also um, Montreal uh, boroughs. Um, and if you go check this project, you'll see that I created a small chart with a time lapse and you can see uh, the movements between provinces, between regions in Quebec uh, and also uh, regions in a uh, neighborhood in Montreal and it's linked with the number of cases that we saw. So this analysis was made um, with Python because I had a huge volume of data you can imagine for each um, geographical area. I knew how many people went from uh, to different places uh, based on cell phone data location. So you need to code to, to do this kind of analysis. And then I created uh, this kind of uh, animated charts uh, to show the movements, but also the number uh, of cases uh, of COVID cases uh, through time um, and the correlation um, there was uh, with in Quebec, the spring break that happened before everything closed uh, and that uh, unfortunately um, partly triggered uh, the number of cases uh, in Quebec. But a big thing that I wanted to do in 2020 um, was to code 3D data visualizations. Uh, I decided to do 3D data visualizations before the pandemic, uh, but then the pandemic happened and uh, I decided to apply uh, this vision to COVID data. And it was a big part uh, of my year as well. The idea was to create 3D data visualization that would be more immersive um, and um, more visually interesting than 2D representations. So for example, uh, this project, who has died from COVID-19 in Canada, um, when you switch uh, from one slide uh, to the other with the, the arrows on the side, if you're on mobile, it's actually a swipe format. Uh, I don't know if you know the term uh, scrolly telling. It's when you scroll and there's animation that are triggered uh, while you scroll. Uh, I call this format swipey telling because you swipe and things happen. Um, so the idea was to create a representation where each case of COVID-19 would be a particle. Uh, you can see them here uh, moving around um, and to do an analysis of specifically the death. So if we go a bit further, you see that the red particles are actually COVID-19 death. And with this 3D data visualization, uh, the idea was to explain step by step with very small uh, quantity of text, um, some things that we knew about the people who 
unfortunately died of COVID-19. And because it's in 3D, um, I was able to create this perspective um, effect. And I switch between the perspective effect, which is nice, but it's not good to compare uh, proportion or quantities, and a front side of the data. Uh, so now you, you have a real idea of the proportion. So this kind of project, it's a way to explain to the readers something that is quite complicated and actually is a lot of numbers and statistics, but in a very simple and very effective format. Of course, it works really well on mobile phone too, because more than half of our readers now are on mobile phones. So I need to find formats um, uh, and to create projects that work very well on very small screens. And as you can see, this would work very well uh, and there's a small amount of text each time. So it's a very immersive representation um, and I will let you uh, read it. Uh, it's in our portfolio, the link that uh, David uh, shared. So this was one project with particles uh, and about uh, death, uh, COVID death that we published uh, during the summer. Uh, but I wanted to explore another side of, um, of 3D uh, data visualization. And for this project about the economic impact of COVID-19 in Canada, I was a little bit inspired by uh, video games. So the idea was to take five economic indicators and to have the historical data for these indicators. Um, and instead of drawing a line chart, the idea was to create a universe for each one and the line would actually be the ground and we would add um, some elements uh, to that. And I created a small uh, um, uh, interface uh, to, to, uh, to, to simulate a conversation between me and the reader. Uh, so as you can see, I'm here uh, and the small character is a 3D clone of myself and you can choose uh, your different uh, uh, the indicators. So for example, if we go uh, to the number of travelers, see we land in this universe um, and uh, the metric is the foreign travelers per month in Canada. You have the chart here, the line chart, but actually the same line chart is made in 3D here and you have um, you have some elements uh, related to uh, these indicators. And while you work with me on the chart, uh, you meet experts um, and the conversation between me and you becomes a conversation also with an expert that explains, uh, okay, how historically this indicator changed uh, through, the, through the years, uh, but also the very impressive impact uh, of COVID-19 at the end. And so the idea was to compare the previous crisis, economic crisis uh, in Canada to the one that um, happened and is still happening uh, in Canada. So you see, we go through time. Now we're in 28, 20, uh, 2008. And at the end, you can see you can see COVID-19, the number of travelers, tourist, tourism crashed in Canada. So this was another way of explaining something that would be uh, quite long and complicated, a very, with a very visual and interactive and dynamic uh, approach. Uh, but it's still, of course, journalism. It's uh, data journalism. It's interactive journalism. It's visual journalism. Um, but in 3D. And another project that I decided to do uh, in 2020 was um, a visualization that would wrap up 2020, um, the pandemic in Canada in 2020. So the idea was a little bit different. It was to create um, a, um, a mapping project where the map would be in 3D. And instead of uh, doing circles on the map, a 2D map, instead of doing um, uh, colors uh, on the map, chloropleth uh, maps, uh, I decided to create spikes. 
And the idea was, again, to talk about something that we knew for, we just heard numbers every day about uh, COVID-19 cases and death. But the idea was to present them in a very different manner. Um, so you would be uh, um, very interested to read that because you never saw the data uh, this way. So what you see here, the spikes, uh, it's actually the number of cases per 100,000 people for each health region in Canada. So here is Montreal, uh, Toronto is here, and uh, when you go through the project, I present you from different perspectives in the country and I explain you what happened during the first half of the pandemic and the second half of the pandemic with the number of cases and also the number of deaths still uh, per uh, 100,000 uh, people. So during the first half of the pandemic, for example, you can clearly see uh, that Montreal and Laval uh, had the highest, highest uh, death rates uh, in the whole country. It's, it's very obvious. And the idea, this is scroll detailing, but in 3D, uh, is also to give you small amount of text to explain to explain to you step by step what actually happened um, during this uh, very special 2020 year. Um, and with the animation, I'm able to show you, OK, so this was the first half. Now, here's the second half of the pandemic. Um, and how different it was, especially for Central Canada and, um, and BC. And you can see that the number of cases was way higher during the second half of the pandemic. So that was another approach, uh, this time for a, car a cartographic project, for a mapping project, uh, but still made differently in 3D uh, to be able to, uh, to show that and to explain what happened differently uh, to the readers. Um, in this project, there was also a little bit of uh, customization. So if you enter your, the, three first, the first three letters of your postal code, um, I created a small script that was able to uh, identify your health region. And then I was able to give you specific information about your health region. So for example, here it's Montreal and some um, some part of the text were created uh, dynamic, um, um, especially especially just for you. So, for example, this text shows me uh, some stats just for Montreal, and it's comparing uh, Montreal to the other regions in my province. So that was another approach uh, to data journalism, to data visualization. Uh, it's interactive. Um, and uh, in the same time, uh, quite immersive, and it works really well on both big screens. So for example, this uh, desktop uh, screen that I'm sharing, but it works also very well and is very um, efficient on very small screens like your mobile phone, uh, for example. So this is uh, pretty much what I did uh, on top of other projects in 2020. And I'm still exploring uh, 3D data visualization. I have, uh, have several other projects that I will publish uh, in 2021 using these techniques. Um, I think it's a great way to create something very engaging for the readers uh, and to explain numbers in a, different, in a different way. I don't know if there's uh, any questions. Yes, there are. So we have a few questions for you here. Um, was this seriously programmed in Python? What is the 3D visual interface that you are programming in? That is very impressive. I believe that was in direct reference to the video game uh, one. Yeah. So no, it's not Python. Um, it's JavaScript. Um, there's um, a library uh, that I love, which is called 3GS. Um, I think I'm still sharing my screen so you can see that. And it's a JavaScript library uh, to create 3D uh, in the browser. And that's what I use. Um, you can do tons of things with that. I just applied this uh, library to data journalism and data visualizations. 
Um, and it's very well done. You can check the examples, the documentation. If you code in JavaScript, it's uh, it's great. Um, I learned that at the beginning of uh, 2020 in, Janu in January, and then I decided to apply uh, to apply my learnings uh, to uh, to data journalism. And what is behind that, uh, if you know a little bit of uh, HTML and JavaScript, um, is it's a, te uh, a technology called WebGL, uh, which instead of using the processor uh, of your computer or your phone, it's using the um, graphic card uh, in your computer. So you have um, a more efficient way to do calculations and um, it allows you to draw on a canvas HTML element, uh, which is also very efficient. And that's why you, you're able to create um, this kind of 3D universe and it's uh, very efficient even if you have an old phone or an old computer. And uh, Niall, uh, we had a question that was um, the data that you were showing, I guess, on the on the maps. Uh, oh, that gave me like a triple chin. Uh, the data that you're showing on the map, is this dynamic data that you are showing or is it uh, static values? <laughs> so can you interface with an API if that is that possible? So I guess it's this project. Um, this project is not uh, dynamic. It's uh, spatified data. Uh, so I think I published, yeah, I published in December uh, 16th. Uh, so it's the data uh, probably until December 15th. Um, but since there was an, 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 an analysis of what happened, um, I had to, to decide to stop at some point because uh, otherwise I would be I would need to change my text all the time. So this project is a one-off project. Uh, it's published on a date, a specific date, and it stays like that. But all the other projects, for example, the state of the pandemic, uh, where you can uh, create your own charts and um, COVID-19, the latest numbers. Uh, all of this is dynamic and uh, we have an API, API that we use uh, to update all of that all the time. Um, so it's different kind of projects. Right, and the uh, the next question is one I'm also really interested in. Uh, what, what is the reader response or completion rates uh, like for these 3D interactives compared to more lo-fi stories? It really depends. I'll be honest, it really depends. Uh, this one, the map uh, worked extremely well. We saw that people stayed on it until the very end, uh, and uh, it was actually quite impressive. Uh, but other projects, like the one about the economy, uh, didn't work as much as I hoped. Uh, I think it was because there was too many interactions, uh, but also we published that during summer, uh, so maybe people weren't as much interested as I was about the economic consequences of the pandemic um, during summer. But in general, uh, we have uh, twice or three, sometimes four times uh, the engagement time than a, a traditional web story. Uh, we see that very clearly and we also see that it's uh, way more shared on social media um, because people find that very uh, enjoyable as an experience to watch and it's very different so they have a tendency to share to yeah to share more often this kind of project um, and basically our 3d projects right now, last year were part of the top red uh, of the year um, well, and uh, Megan asks, uh, well, first she compliments you. She says, what a fantastic way to tell stories. <laughs> she asks, uh, are there any specific packages uh, you use for the 3D visualizations? You previously mentioned, uh, I believe, Web WebGL. I don't know if that's just the interface or if that's a, a package, but. Yeah, so uh, for the 3D data visualization, it's uh, for the, the 3D itself, it's 3GS. Uh, then I use also uh, D3 scale. So, you know, D3. Uh, it's a data visualization to create. Um, it's a, um, a JavaScript library package to create a, a 2D uh, visualization. It's 
one of the most used, I think, for data visualization these days. So I use uh, some functions from this library, for example, the scales, uh, because, for example, when you see the spikes here, everything is proportional, right? So the bigger the spike, the bigger is the number of cases uh, per 100,000 people. Uh, so you have to scale that. So uh, there's already tons of functions to do that with D3. Uh, so I use D3 uh, and also a little bit of D3 for the data uh, cleaning, data wrangling, and then uh, 3GS for uh, the 3D itself. And also last year we switched uh, to React. So uh, React is a, a library um, a framework, if I'm if I'm correct, uh, to uh, organize your code and uh, to to manage your code in a certain way. So, for example, uh, everything is break broke down by component. Uh, so um, my card here, the text here is a React component, and uh, each time a card is uh, visible on the window, it triggers a JavaScript function, which is a mix of D3 and 3GS to draw behind all of the data visualization. So that's the way it works. Great, so we just got um, a few more questions here. Uh, yeah. time we've left. Uh, Edel says that really cool, fun, cool and fun projects. And he says, uh, does your team hire international full stack data visual journalists with Python, JS, C Sharp, uh, Unity, game dev stuff, or design background because they want to move to Canada? So, uh, <laughs> so I guess that's a question. I mean, what is your what is it, your team composition? Yeah, uh, so uh, my team is kind of special at CBC Radio Canada. So we are a small team of eight people, um, roughly eight eight to 10 people. And um, we are two uh, journalists. Um, we are two developers, uh, two designers, and uh, one desk editor, uh, and also um, a coordinator and uh, a motion designer. Um, and uh, we work all together. Uh, even if I code my most of my projects, uh, we all, always work all together. Uh, we have a backend developer for our infrastructure, our servers, our API, and um, yeah. But um, you can also, if you have more uh, personal questions or uh, interrogations about my team, or uh, maybe uh, any kind of information related to to, to 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 my work or the positions in my team, you can send me a message on Twitter or uh, to my email. I will be happy to uh, to answer. Great. Uh, so uh, Annie asks, how do these article interactions change between desktop versus mobile? Do you adjust or deactivate some features and interactions with smaller screen sizes? Very good question. I hate to uh, deactivate some um, features because I think that people should have the same amount of information on their mobile and on their desktop. And it's not because you have a smaller screen that I should give you less. <laughs> uh, so I think you still, you're, you see my screen? Yep. You still see my screen? I just have the chart B plug in here. Uh, so this is the, the 3D map, but the mobile version. And uh, as you can see, the experience and the, the amount of content is exactly the same. What I do is that I play with the screen ratio and the way I deal with my camera in the 3D universe. Um, so everything work, looks good on mobile, even if your screen is narrow, um, and on desktop, even if your screen is very large. Uh, that's a French word, large, uh, wide. <laughs> And as you can see, you have exactly the same experience. It's a challenge uh, to be able to fit everything, uh, but when you get used to it, it's great because the people on the mobile, which is half your readership, uh, are also have a very nice experience. So if I switch to, for example, the economic impact of the 
COVID-19, you can see that now uh, we, we tell you that you need to swipe to move in this project. So if you swipe, you have the same experience. And of course, I, I think about it beforehand. So instead of placing all of the universe one after the other uh, on a wide scale, of course, I will place everything on a vertical uh, scale. So it will work well on mobile. And as you can see, it's the same. So if we go check the oil price, everything works extremely well. It's the same experience. You just have to think about it beforehand. What I do usually is I code my mobile version first, and if it works on mobile, most of the time it will work really well on desktop as well. So you see, it's the same experience. If we go check the one about the debt, again, on mobile, you can swipe. And you see you have the text below and you can always swipe and everything works nicely. The very important thing is to think vertically instead of thinking uh, on a wide scale. Uh, that's very important. That's the way you will transition very easily between uh, desktop screens and mobile screens. So, thanks, Daniel. So we have one more question. Uh, I, I, maybe you could just try and address it uh, a little quickly. Quickly, I know it's, it might be a little heady. And then we have, I know we have some questions queued up. Uh, if you have questions that aren't published in the main chat, maybe just tweet at Niall after. I'm sure he'll be yeah. happy to answer you. Uh, yes. So I'm just going to do this final question. Uh, based on the design in 3JS.org, how long did it take you to create the uh, map view? And are you able to share the 3D view you created? Um, so the time it took, uh, basically it took me maybe two or three weeks just to learn and to be very comfortable with the library and to be able to create what I want. Uh, but then I also needed to create all the React component uh, to, to take this into account. Um, so uh, I don't know, it's maybe maybe a, a month of work firsthand, and then I was able to reuse most of my code uh, uh, to publish stories. So when the template and the boilerplate is ready, uh, it's mostly the same amount of time uh, than creating a 2D database. It's just that uh, you need to have all of this uh, ready uh, beforehand. Yeah. So now, can I use your Gmail? Can I publish that in the chat for people? Uh, send the Radio Canada one. Radio Canada. Nael. Okay. at or cbc.ca works well. Also, All right, I'll, I'll, I'll find you. I have your proper email. I'll post it there uh, during the break uh, because we got to. I, I've got to thank you profusely uh, right now for doing <laughs> this. And, My pleasure. Uh, yeah, thanks. And we're just going to come back with our final panel, not just of data driven 2021 day two, but of the entire two day uh, event. So uh, stay tuned. Thanks, Niall. Take care. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the final event of day two uh, for Data Driven 2021. And I am happy to once again, if not sharing the physical space with the virtual space, with Wukash Pawlowski. Uh, hello, Wukash, and uh, let me just give you the proper introduction that you deserve. Uh, he is the project manager for Microsoft Power BI and gives excellent that I mean that's a maybe you can maybe you can give a more a more fulsome bio of yourself. I only know of your most recent accomplishments of being the guy behind Microsoft Power BI uh, to create uh, interact and you you show everyone how to create interactive embeddable data viz and you work a lot with uh, journalists from around the world. So uh, welcome. Oh, thank you so much to David and, and everyone for having me. Really honored to be speaking at Data Driven TO and uh, just really happy to be talking to Canadians. I don't know if folks know, but I actually grew up in Newfoundland, so I'm really excited to be speaking uh, to you about this passion project of mine around journalism. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about Power BI and what Microsoft does to enable journalists, and I'm going to show you a number of examples. Uh, before we get, get too far into it, I wanted to introduce myself more properly, as David said. So I'm a program manager on the Power BI product team. 
so I actually build the software that I'm going to demonstrate today, and I work with customers to figure out what they need, and then I work with journalists to support them as they try to use those tools to both discover as well as tell stories. And you know, I grew up in Newfoundland, you know, uh, and then went to University of Waterloo. When it came down, was fortunate enough to get a job at Microsoft and and have stayed here and developed data tools since then. Uh, my my role has taken me to a number of different places. You know, I've been a judge on the Data Journalism Awards run by uh, the Global Editors Network uh, for a couple of years. Um, I've worked with a lot of different um, news organizations. You'll see some of them on the subsequent slides. Uh, really helping people understand how data can be transformative, both in the process of discovering stories as well as in the process of telling stories. And so I wanted to, to do a number of things with us. First, I wanted to ground out on what Microsoft does. You know, like we're really all about empowering everyone and every organization to achieve more. I mean, in the space of journalism, it's a lot of it is about working with partners, folks like the Associated Press, um, whether, whether that's, you know, on water quality reporting, um, home ownership reporting, election reporting, uh, Recode and Politico in various ways. Uh, really top tier publishers who have really demanding uh, requirements, but also helping regional players, right? Smaller newsrooms, you know, people like the Albany Times Union, where literally there's one person, Kathleen Crowley, uh, who's their data team. And, you know, enabling her and her colleagues to take the data journalism journey um, and then, you know, working with others to spread the, the, the information on how data can be transformative, not only, you know, for individual journalists who are trying to find and tell stories, but also for organizations and how newsrooms can modernize using some, some updated technology to be more productive, find um, new stories more easily. Uh, and then also do some some kind of non-traditional style storytelling, you know, with partners like NASCAR or, or the non-obvious company, where we can we can target a different kind of person who just doesn't know what data visualization could do for them and get them inspired to to learn more. So today, in the time that I have, I wanted to show you some examples of what Power BI can do, uh, give you some inspiration of how it can be used in a non-traditional way. You know, like when we talk about data journalism, we're often talking about infographics or or interactives that are on a website but i wanted to show you some examples of how the exact technologies that i'm going to demonstrate in the third sort of stanza of this presentation can be used in a broadcast journalism space with an example from the french presidential election from a couple of years ago and then we'll talk about a specific journalist that i've had the privilege to work with and talk about how her journey to become a data journalist started and with some of her learnings, so hopefully to inspire you. And then we'll close out with enough time for questions and some resourcing uh, that, that can help you uh, get going. All right, so let's start with some examples. And I know that you've seen a number of COVID-19 examples over the course of, of today, but I wanted to use those because they're very topical as a way to show you some of the capabilities that Power BI brings to the interactive reporting space that are very achievable. And then I'll show you in the demo how to achieve some of those um, through the tooling. So let's go ahead and take a look here uh, real quick at some some uh, of the existing dashboards that, that we have. Now, this is a dashboard that our AI for Health team has built, and we didn't only just build this dashboard. It actually stays up to date and refreshes, and we've provided this as a tooling kit for other organizations, primarily government entities, but some nonprofits have used it as well to uh, build uh, COVID-19 reporting and accelerate how quickly that information can come out. The important thing about this is that this data stays up to date and is fresh. Um, it is fully interactive, right? So you can go and click through all these different aspects of the data when, whenever you want to dig into it. Uh, you can view things as a map or as a chart. Now, these are things that, you know, you would expect to be able to build as a JavaScript coder, you know, if you're building something with D3.js. Um, but these visuals are fully interactive uh, and embeddable, and you don't actually have to write a line of code to achieve these sorts of experiences, right? So you can see that I can go and cross filter and highlight all of these different aspects here without having to write any kind of code to go do that. And it's very expressive, meaning that I can go and provide the insights that I desire. For example, here the report author 
pulled out the top level uh, number here at the very peak, as well as the most current number, so that I can convey the information that's important for that audience to go see. Now, so this report is, is one that we've produced, but here's an example from the state of Washington, uh, where I live. So I live in Seattle in Washington. Um, and so this is the actual official state of Washington COVID-19 dashboard, uh, where you can see how the county that I live in, which is King County, is doing. Right, but I can also go through and have these great detailed pages designed in a way that's easy for the general public to understand. You know, as we talk about using data to provide to, to inform society, which is a lot of what journalism does, right? It pulls out stories to inform society, to cause debate and, and impact the world, right? It's about also being able to clearly and effectively communicate. And these visualizations, I think, have done a pretty good job trying to get to that state for a, a broad number of, of applications. One of the most important parts about data journalism is that you need to be able to convey the message. And sometimes that's using data visualization best practices, you know, like how to create a beautiful um, table. And I'll show you an example of that in a second where data visualization practices help convey the information. But sometimes as part of journalists, you need to tell the story. And so here's an example of where the state of Washington used a thermometer style visual, again, fully data driven, um, but customized so that in the case of vaccinations, which are a hot topic uh, in the United States and globally, um, they're able to convey that information effectively to the audience for this particular um, report and visualization. Now, as I go forward, like I can actually show you this great example, and this is from the state of Nevada. Again, a similar kind of report, same topic, but you'll notice here how they've actually gone and used some of those standard visualization best practices, things that you would expect to see in a book by Stephen Few or Edward Tufte, you know, these folks that are, or even Alberto Cairo, uh, folks who are helping us understand how best and accurately to convey information. Um, but here it's used as a really nice way to show uh, three different decompositions of the same data by age, by gender, and by ethnicity and race, so that you can get a sense of the distributions here at a very quick visual glance with very, very clear uh, presentation of the total numbers, uh, the population affected, and then the distributions that are here underneath it. So all of these things are elements of what, as you know, we go through and learn how to do data journalism, are elements of the presentation of that story, right? And so it's really important that we, we think through how do we go build these systems? Can we build them quickly as a journalist? Uh, journalists, unlike um, some, some others, right, are really in this very deadline-driven world. So using tools and capabilities that allow product to be created very quickly maintaining accuracy and clarity with the kind of interactivity that you're seeing here is really important in order to support the kind of, of uh, working style that happens in the journalism space. So with that, let me let me quickly just jump back in and I wanted to come to show a couple of other examples, right? So this is a great example of where, you know, you're we're presenting information uh, around COVID-19. Here's another example. This is actually one that you can go look at right now. It's on the Stats Canada uh, website. Um, there's a link down here. I don't know if you can type it in the time that that, that you have. It's a, not, not the most pleasant URL, but let's go take a look at, at what the Stats Canada has created for, for their report, right? So here's an example of a government communicating other information. In this case, it's payroll and earnings information. So what I can do is I can, as a as a citizen, come in here and you know pick a particular visualization. Oops, uh, I guess I need to refresh this. Um, and, uh, and and so I can go and pick a particular um, uh, province. Like so, I grew up in Newfoundland, and so maybe I should go look at at that, interact with it to see how educational services or accommodation and food services are doing in in my area. I can even do things like. Uh, create advanced tooltips over top of things so I can shine through more detailed information as users interact with my, my content. 
Now, as a journalist, it's also interesting to think about these sites, and a lot of governments have these sites. Sometimes they're using you know, Power BI, sometimes they're using other tools. These sites contain a lot of data that you can request. So in, a, in the United States, there's the Freedom of Information Act, FOIA. So you can go through and ask for this data, and then you can pull it into the tools like Power BI to process it and analyze it, maybe even merge it with other data or other information you have so that you can find unique stories within the, the overall uh, data. So a very compelling kind of use case here from Stats Canada. Now, what I wanted to do was I wanted to show how all of these visualizations when, you know, we've been seeing so far examples of a website with an interactive visual in it. And quite often news stories are written that way. You know, there's some text and then there's an embedded visualization and that's great. Uh, some people scroll right past it. Some people engage with it. But you can use the exact same technologies as this with some commodity hardware quite often. Uh, a touch screen, a large touch screen, and you can actually build really compelling broadcast journalism or YouTube style social media friendly journalism in order to express more about the data and start more deeper conversations. So here what I want to do is I wanted to play a little video and it's actually from the French presidential election a few years ago um, and it's in French. Uh, so I hope there's some some francophones uh, on the call. Um, but uh, I'll let it play a little bit and then I'll explain what happened um, as we go through. Bonjour, Fanny Conti, Fanny qui, grâce à notre partenaire en Microsoft, nous permet d'analyser ce scrutin encore plus précisément, notamment par rapport au... Pardon me? Bonjour, Fanny Conti, Fanny qui, grâce à notre partenaire en Microsoft... Right, so what's happening here is we have a core presenter and then a, a reporter who are going to engage in a conversation about data right on screen on national television. And the screen that's back there is just a normal touch screen device. You know, it's maybe a little bit bigger than we all have access to, but it's just a regular touch screen device and it's running the Power BI app. Um, and in the app, there's a report and that report is fully interactive. So as we go forward, what's going to happen is uh, our reporter, Fanny, uh, we'll go ahead and um, uh, we, we'll, we'll go ahead and interact and explain the data uh, live on air. And so here what you can see is using pen and touch gestures, uh, she's able to very precisely highlight a specific point of a data story for an audience that's very, you know, it, it, it may not understand this level of data, but she's able to use these kinds of tools in order to, to show this. If we played forward, we would see that she can compare back and forth different, uh, different voting for Macron and Marine Le Pen, and then see how those are and, and develop a conversation about the data, making the data more real and approachable for a lot of users. Since uh, for many people, actually interacting with an interactive on a website is actually kind of hard and they don't really know what they can get out of it. And so in this way, the journalist is able to help the narrative explain what's happening behind the data so that the audience can 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 uh, be enlightened through that process. All right, so now let's go and 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 take a look at the next step. We've seen a, a number of examples, but I wanted to give you a sense of the, the capabilities and the tool. The primary tool that you'll use with Power BI to go create these reports and do the, do the number crunching, clean data, merge data from multiple different sources is Power BI Desktop. And you can grab Power BI Desktop from the link that's here, or if you go to powerbi.com, uh, just powerbi, all one word, .com, you can go download it from there as well. And it's a tool that's actually free to download. Uh, you can just go ahead and use it. It is Windows based and it allows you to then do the operation of creating the reports. Now, uh, to support our demo and just to go a little quick, I'm going to just pull up a report 
that we've published as part of a toolkit for COVID-19. Um, but I'm not really going to spend a lot of time talking about COVID-19 data. We're going to talk about how this report is built. Uh, so several things about Power BI Desktop. The first is that you're able to, uh, in an easy way, access pretty much any kind of data that you that, that you want. Right. So here, for example, I can pull in data from Excel files, different kinds of data sets, databases, text files. We even do a pretty good job of just scraping the web so you can just point it at a table on a public website and it'll pull in the data and you can clean it up and pull it in. Importantly, there's no limit on how many different sources of data you can pull into this tool and then mash it up all together to create the resulting views. And the primary view here is a report view where you have a set of visualizations. So uh, for example, this, this view here, and you see that it's fully interactive, is a matrix. And you can see over on the right hand side, we have a whole palette of different kinds of visualizations that you can use. We also have the ability to add more visuals. Now you can code your own. So if you are a D3 or even a, um, you know, a, pretty much any JavaScript uh, web-based framework you can pull in here. Um, but we also have a store of visuals. Many of them are free uh, that you can just download and start using. And then they show up uh, here at the bottom of the pane, just like these ones, these ones here. All right. So the next thing that we have is we have a set of data and this is formatted as, as different tables. So for example, here I have, you know, the, the main data table um, and I also have the ability to have additional tables. We have the ability to create measures, which are calculations. So for example, here, if I select the case fatality rate, you can see that I can do mathematics. Now, this is a very simple example for the sake of demo. You can do incredibly sophisticated calculations here over data at pretty much any scale, uh, meaning like you can have millions of rows of data, no problems, and it'll, it'll crunch through them really, really accurately. The other thing that's really great about this is that you can bring together multiple tables of data and using relationships, you can relate them. So it's easier to uh, summarize. For example, here I have yeah, the country and I have a state. I can summarize all the cases by state really, really easily um, and I can generate the summary statistics. And if you wanted to have multiple relationships and a whole tree of relationships, you can go ahead and do that. So if you have more sophisticated uh, spaces or if you're getting from a government agency or from other some data source, uh, multiple files like 10 different files and you need to integrate them and relate them together, you can do that easily. Of course, we also have the ability to do that data integration in a very robust way under the transform capability. And I can actually go through and pull data from some source, uh, do any number of different uh, manipulations of that uh, and see all the results here and go through and, and, and shape the data, clean the data and merge the data however I wish to do within the capability. So now when we talk about some of these interactive experiences, uh, if you're trying to build those in D3, they can be actually quite time consuming. Well, let me just show you some of these experiences that I was that I was showing. I was showing navigation between different buttons. Uh, so, for example, here there's existing buttons. So I can just go uh, click on total deaths, and you know you see that it it highlights this map. I I click back on confirmed cases. But let's go see what the process is like of actually creating that interaction. So it starts by inserting a button here uh, from the Power BI ribbon. And I'm just going to use the right arrow just because it's easy and visual. Just going to drag it in here. Now the way these buttons work is on the right hand side, I have a set of actions and I can go define what kind of action that is. So let me just zoom in a little bit. I can go back to a previous uh, place I was in. I can create a bookmark and that's what we'll use here in a second uh, and a number of other actions. Now the bookmark, when I choose that, uh, there, there can be different bookmarks defined in the report and you as the report author, get to choose whatever bookmark. So let's go and create a new bookmark and show you that process really quickly. So what you notice on this top level confirmed cases map is that New York State is, is uh, a little bit worse than some of the others uh, in this data. So what I can do is I can click on, on New York State. Actually, I could go and manipulate any of these other fields as well, but I think for now I'll just click on, on, um, on New York. And then what I can do is in the view tab up here, I can go to my bookmarks control 
and I can go ahead and add a new bookmark. And so in this bookmark, I actually have New York already defined. Um, I guess I practiced. Uh, let's go New York too. And uh, I'm going to go create that. And then I'm just going to go make sure that it's set to exactly the state that I'm in. So now what happens is if I go back and I click on uh, confirmed cases over here, uh, and then I click on uh, this New York. Oh, I need to wire it up. I didn't do the next step. I need to wire up the action for this button. Uh, that's what I was missing. Uh, I need to come into the bookmarks, scroll down to New York 2, and it's right here at the very, very bottom. Let me just go ahead and set that. And I just provide a tooltip, show New York. I recommend this, by the way. Uh, when you're doing visualizations, it's also important to consider accessibility needs. And so these tooltips enable people uh, to follow along with screen readers and other accessible technologies. All right, so now what I can do is I can click through to deaths, but I can, you can also see that I have my new tooltip that says show New York. And when I click on it, it goes back into that state of show New York. And all these experiences where we're flipping these things back and forth are using all of these bookmarks. We have the ability to have multiple items on the page. Uh, you can group items. And so, for example, one thing that this report author did when, when they initially built this is they have different states so that some things are hidden and some things are visible and you can flip back and forth. So all those examples where I was showing you flipping between a map and a chart are just creating two different bookmarks, creating a couple of buttons, switching between the bookmarks, and it's just that easy. You don't have to actually do a lot of real work to go do it. Now, uh, when you start in Power BI, you're probably not gonna have all these visuals created. Uh, now adding uh, a visual is really, really, really easy. Now you can of course add one here from the visualizations pane, but I wanted to um, show you a couple of other experiences that we have as well. Uh, decomposition tree is a great example of visualization. And what it does is it takes things like uh, individual measures, uh, maybe you can take some state information, maybe all the way down to the county, and it helps you view all of that data and explore it. One thing that's really uh, unheralded in the data visualization community around data journalism is that a lot of the work happens in understanding your data, finding stories in with the data, and then, then after that you choose how to present it. And so this visualization helps you do that. So for example, here I have cases. I'm just gonna press this high value case and you'll notice that immediately Without really knowing the data, New York jumps out as the number one in terms of cases in this particular data set. And if I go one step further, you can see that Queens County is the number one um, uh, county in which there are cases. And what this does to me as a journalist, it lets me fine tune where I should go to find uh, the stories that would be the most compelling ones. Like, so if I wanted to look at how hospitals are doing, are, are they overloaded or not, this can give me a, a, a quick way of validating that I'm working, I, I'm going to go tell the most compelling story that's available in the data. Similarly, uh, you can go and take a look at um, some other capabilities, like we have a smart narratives experience. And what this is doing is it's using machine learning and AI in order to automatically summarize all the data that you're seeing on the uh, on the chart uh, or on this page. So for example, when I click on New York, you'll notice that this actually gets updated with the data specific to New York. I, of course, can go ahead and, and customize these narratives to my own needs. So for example, I can look up state and then include it uh, here as a specific value. And when I do so, you'll notice that New York is pasted right on in here and I can rearrange this and format it to my needs. Uh, but this kind of capability of bringing the data out of the visualizations into some kind of a narrative form that you as a, uh, as a journalist can read it and quickly copy and paste those things to put into an article. Maybe if you're more in a traditional publishing, website publishing or print publishing role, then this helps you bootstrap those and get those insights a little bit more quickly. Uh, so it's a, it's a really a great uh, kind of experience. And I think what I would say is there's a lot more that you can do in, in Power BI and Power BI Desktop. It's just uh, you have to go in and, 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 and explore it a little bit. Now, once you're done with that, what you would do is you would publish this up to the Power BI service 
after saving your change. Uh, and then from there, if you wanted to publish interactive, you could go publish it out onto, onto a public website. All right, so let me jump back uh, into the slides because I think, you know, like now that we've seen how easy it is to go create this and but also talked a little bit about the process of in taking data, finding some insight like where in New York State to go to look for a COVID-19 story, um, that would be uh, a, a journey that, that you have to go through and then you can figure out how to present it. And really to crystallize this, I wanted to talk about a, a journalist, Vera Okeo, who I had the privilege of working with um, as she developed from a traditional uh, print and broadcast journalist into someone who's capable in data journalism. And, and she actually learned how to go through the whole process. Uh, now, she was tasked with a specific story and she applied for a grant uh, uh, through the ICFJ to support that storytelling and using data to help support that storytelling. And so I was able to help it, help her through that program to, to uh, learn those skills. What she needed to do was she needed to look at the child mortality rates in Kenya and find what was actually happening. And when she approached it initially, she approached it as she would use the data tools to present data about child mortality, maybe with the top causes. And then she would go to uh, people who she was uh, fairly well she knew already were key people in various uh, uh, parts of, of the Kenya hierarchy whether that was uh, in the in the government in the health department whether that was key uh, professionals in professional associations like doctors or nurses and so forth or key community leaders and she as a journalist had developed those contacts over uh, a number of years and so she knew who to ask about opinions about and, and storylines and what was what's actually going on behind this data and as we went through that whole process it was actually very interesting because as we looked at the data it was clear that her initial story plan um, was not initially infused by the data and so what we helped do is we we helped uh, her think about that map that she created she created a map that showed where the remote tally was was highest and lowest and together we explored and, and had her go out into the communities where it was the highest and speak to people who were um, maybe unfamiliar to her initially, right? And from there, she was able to find new and compelling storylines. Actually, she found things that were not in the common discussion happening amongst those people that she already knew. And she was able to find those by looking at the data, following the data, and then bringing the insights that she gleaned from following that data back into the regular conversation. And in that way, she actually uh, did some very groundbreaking journalism within Kenya, gained a lot of prominence in her newsroom, gained accolades by because she was able to develop this new skill. And it wasn't sophisticated data visualization. It wasn't writing D3. It wasn't doing those things that some of us uh, uh, associate with, with data journalism. It was actually by learning the basic tooling for how to investigate data. And importantly, it was a mindset shift. It was adopting a data mindset to see what's going on in the data, learn how to inquire about what that data is saying and then follow the process of bringing those those inquiries and the answers and the propositions that people are making about that data back into uh, the, the lens of journalism in general. So I think this is a really amazing story of how a person who really wasn't a data journalism, didn't have the basic uh, skills or didn't have, did, well, wasn't interested in being per se a data journalist uh, by, by trade, was able to use data journalism to enhance the storytelling in, in, in an area. All right, so now we've done a number of these and I've had the privilege of working with an, a, a large number of organizations and we've put a number of resources on the Microsoft website. So if you go to Microsoft 365 for journalists, uh, just put AKEADRMS at the beginning of that, you'll find a number of different assets, everything from videos about how you can use different kinds of tools from machine intelligence, as well as Power BI. Uh, there's even an entire course by Alberto Cairo, uh, which uh, shows you how to take data visualization best practices and then embody them inside Power BI. 
Uh, and there's this great data journalism playbook inspired by a project we did with King 5 News here in Seattle, where a team of reporters at King 5 bootstrapped a data journalism practice and we wrote down what all the steps were, what their key insights were, and help you to bootstrap your own as you go forward. And so with that, I'd like to uh, say thank you, leave you with a couple of links, and then open it up for any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Wukash. Uh, we went, we're getting pretty close to the end times here, but I would love, yeah, if anyone has a question now, now would be the time. If not, uh, I posted the link to uh, Microsoft for Journalists in the chat. And you could also just Google the Microsoft uh, Data Journals and Playbook and you'll find it. And eventually I will get all those links up on the StoryLab website because we plan to have a resource page. It's kind of been a work in progress. But Lucas, it appears, Wukash, sorry, it appears that uh, you explained everything so expertly. Oh, we might have one question here. Um, the question was that um, Office 365 has Power BI on board. I'm wondering, however, was there any add-ons required to do what you presented, especially the interactive charting or adding D3JS, or is it all available natively on Power BI? Yeah, so it's all available natively on Power BI. So Power BI Desktop, the tool that I demonstrated is actually free to download, so there's no license required. So you don't even have to be a Power BI subscriber to go use it. So if you wanted to use it to create, um, to explore data, to to talk to others about it, you know, you can just do that all locally on your desktop or share the file around, and so that's that's perfectly fine. Um, if you if you want to share it publicly, then you can do that for free. Though in most newsrooms, you would end up wanting to collaborate on it, so you, there's a nominal ten dollar a month fee for that uh, per user. Uh, but but it's very 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 easy. The capability is actually this this uh, slide shows a number of interactive visuals that are changing and animating, right? Those are all built on, on D3JS. Uh, so we have a Power BI visuals library and a GitHub repo, so you can go in there and learn how to build a visual. You essentially take D3JS code and plop it into our framework and wire it up so that we can pass it data and it can respond to events like click, uh, drag, all those things that you would do. Uh, and then you can package it, reuse it, you can actually share it. So you can like take a visual uh, well, one one challenge with D3 pages quite often is that they're not really reusable. Uh, whereas our Power BI Visual Framework generates a file, it's a PBI Viz file that you can import into any number of reports and then share and and even uh, provide as a gallery. So we have a number of those. Great. Well, thanks so much, Vukash, and thank you for joining us today. And uh, I just like to say before I turn it over to uh, Guillermo Acosta once again, the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Media and Creative Arts, just to, to say good, final goodbyes. I'd like to thank everyone who's been here for watching over the past two days, everyone who will watch this eventually, hopefully from the recording. And of course, all the presenters and uh, who have taken time out of, out of their busy schedules to do this. And to see Manji, who's been working the behind the scenes tech. And uh, without uh, further prompting, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Guillermo. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thank you for for all these. And um, I I you know couldn't finish the day without thanking you, David, for for being the driving force uh, behind that data driven, but also the driving force behind our Humber Study Lab, uh, which is uh, our, our faculty's arm for uh, to explore data driven storytelling and uh, to also bring all this knowledge back to our students and and continue the, these. Uh, is a uh, positive feedback of, of information and, and uh, creation and applied research and knowledge. It's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to be, to be part of this and, and the learnings from these two days have been incredible. Also want to, to thank uh, Sarah Jane uh, Greenway, the Associate Dean of uh, our Journalism and Writers uh, um, Cluster for, for her support to this initiative. And uh, Asim, Asim Maji, our, our tech guru, who has been working for weeks on this and uh, behind the screens uh, to, to keep this going and doing an incredible uh, you know, work in, in keeping us um, uh, online and, and being able to do, to do this. Also, I want to thank our Applied Research and Innovation Department, who has uh, also been a really strong supporter of uh, of this initiative of uh, data driven, but also of our data story lab and uh, Ginger Grant, who's now a new dean of uh, of uh, research, 
for uh, her strong support to to our faculty and and these initiatives, and of course, and to all panelists and presenters who, who have um, come here to 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 you know um, share their knowledge and and, uh, and illuminate all all of us with uh, so so many interesting presentations and so many important topics that have been part of data driven. So thank you so much for for uh, to our audience to be here and uh, and you know we probably will start planning in a week for the next uh, edition of data driven. So you know, uh, David, we had your your work cut out for you. So thank you. Pass it back to you and uh, everybody have a great weekend and um, pass it to David for the last last words of the of the sale of uh, data driven. Sure. So, uh, and and I'll spend my last word uh, for those who are still here. Thank you. Uh, just to say that if you have enjoyed Data Driven 2021, uh, yet yeah, we do this every year. So check our website, humberstorylab.ca, uh, for for more updates on that and other cool things. Also, uh, there are a couple of really great uh, conferences coming up, so you can uh, check out the Northeastern Computation Plus Journalism uh, Symposium happening in February. Uh, as well as the Investigative Reporters and Editors uh, Computer Assisted Reporting Conference happening in March, as well as submit if you're a data journalist for the 2021 Sigma Awards, which are taking the deadline to submit, I believe is February 1st or 2nd. Links to all that are in the chat. And with that, I say thanks a lot uh, for watching and have a great rest of your day and weekend.